it going, everybody? Uh, we'll get started here in a second, just kind of setting a couple things up. Uh, they basically start. Sorry. <clears throat> okay. Uh, they basically start. Sorry. <clears throat> okay. How's it going? Welcome everyone. Or whoever's starting here right now. We're just gonna go into a couple things. Uh, let me know if the audio in the background, like the music or the fan, is a little bit loud. I'm trying to turn it off, but um, yeah. Anyways, okay. We'll just start right off the bat, and as people kind of stream in. Uh, we can kind of go into a little bit further details of all this stuff. Uh, this is our 10th episode of the session. And uh, I'll be answering questions as we go along. To answer a couple of them already, uh, Rogue Artists, in terms of the torso and the anatomy, uh, when you're struggling trying to get it into different perspectives and angles, the idea is that using a, a I guess a visual form that helps you understand how to connect the actual physical thing that you're seeing in observation to something that is a primitive version of it. And what we did in the previous stream beforehand talking about torsos was the use of things like the, um, the pillowcase. And I don't know if I had that demo on me. It might make it easier if I do this instead of drawing the entire thing again uh, to be able to show you just the demo that we had done. Prior to that, I may not be here, but this is kind of the idea. Uh, it kind of shows you this concept of using the uh, pillowcase or a sack, like a canvas sack, and that has essentially a 50 50 situation here, which you can then uh, squeeze, contort, twist, and push in different angles of views, which can be straight or even slightly crouched, whatever the situation is. So uh, we use a simplistic form uh, to basically encompass that area of the torso. Uh, which we would then apply, okay? So Shaheen, in terms of gold bugs, there actually is a bug that is um, that comes in a very shiny gold coloring, silvering as well too, and they're a type of beetle that exists in Costa Rica. can't remember the name of it right now off the top of my head, but I do have a couple samples of it myself. Uh, we had another quick question. Uh, let's see. Oh, the time at the moment for me is 8 p.m. exactly. So, um, in terms of what was gonna, you know, how the streams work is that live sessions usually start around 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. my time. I might be changing this soon in the future because uh, I know there are some people that are asking about these live streams at the current moment in terms of the situation of the affiliate um, subscriber thing. So obviously live and talking with you guys, uh, anybody can join in. Uh, but the previous streams of full length that I do have, I plan to put up on Twitch, but I'll probably only have them be accessed fully to subscribers. Just because, you know, I think uh, the content and, and the amount of information that's being, you know, put on there, uh, I think, you know, I, I wanted to make sure I control it in that way. Um, so that's the, the basic plan that I'm going to go about things. It's kind of treating it almost like a Patreon, where people that do join and subscribe will have access to all the full length previous live sessions, uh, live sessions that are currently going on right now. People will be able to obviously join anytime they want to. I understand time situation wise is a bit tough for everybody. So what I plan to do in the future is that either my Monday or today, I plan to have one in the evening for Pacific time and one in the morning or daytime so that people that are international that might want to come watch if they can are welcome to uh, because I know that the recordings not everybody will have access to them but again like I said it may change in the future uh, to Twitch yeah so anybody wait, right now I'm actually streaming on two uh, or three different platforms at the moment uh, one of them is obviously here on Twitch the second one is actually on YouTube and I'm actually streaming on Facebook as well so I'm actually streaming to three different platforms at one time using OBS. So I figured that out and some, somebody recommended that to me uh, last time. So um, we're going to be drawing a little bit. And I actually have this little skull that was uh, given to me by a company that does a lot of anatomy. Um, 
like display models and stuff like that. And so they gave me a little skull version of it, which has a little uh, magnetic joint, which is really cool. Actually, it attaches to fully, which is really nice. It's got a magnet underneath it. And so um, from there, you know, I'm going to be using this just to do a quick demo on this breakdown of skulls, whether it's like a human skull or going to, let's say, how about an animal skull, like this one over here. We can use skulls like this to kind of give us uh, basically an observation, uh, something to kind of begin with. And drawing from observation or looking at things like anatomy, uh, it's not just about just drawing what you're seeing, but being able to interpret this stuff uh, to keep you know a basic shape of it, but then also to be able to memorize the things as you draw them. So I'm going to be using these as a quick example first as our first demo. Uh, and usually with my live streams, I do, let's say, like a half an hour or an hour talk about advices and things that you guys can consider. And then, of course, I'll be doing just a separate drawing off to the side. So uh, let's see. And again, I do apologize if I do miss any questions. If I um, right now, because we have more people on right now, uh, if things start to keep moving faster, I might miss a question. So if I miss it, it's not on purpose. You guys are welcome to re-ask again. Uh, so like I said, anytime I feel you feel like I've missed something, please repeat. Ibrew18, you're welcome to share whatever you like. Absolutely. So we'll start off with the human skull, and we'll come back to the animal skull here in a second. This is a bobcat, uh, and I'm going to use this just kind of white piece of paper to sketch and draw on. And uh, I will be using a new pen. I'm also going to talk about this new pen that I actually just got. Uh, I have two different fountain pens here, and people have asked me about certain tools that I draw with. Uh, currently in my classes when I teach, um, I normally teach people where you would have to actually use a fine liner tool like this one here. Um, so the permanence of it, you know, is something that helps you overcome a lot of the problems of hesitancy of drawing. So this, the idea is you're supposed to be able to build confidence by committing to the drawing and making mistakes. Let me turn down the music a bit more. Apologies. So besides pens like this, which you can use or which are like Stedler pens, Faber-Castells, this is the Arteza brand. I like to use personally fountain pens like this one. Now this one in particular over here on my right is the Sailor brand, the Sailor fountain pen, uh, which comes in a fine tip. I normally use the fine tips. And so this particular one, if I use a scrap sheet, you'll notice that the flow is actually quite smooth, whether I'm drawing rounded forms, straight lines, whatever the case is. Pressure, you can start to see that the line kind of holds a relatively strong line here. But I actually just got this other pen, which I wanted to share with you guys. This one is made by Pilot, which is another Japanese brand. Uh, this one I got on nibs.com. Uh, it's a bit more pricier. The Sailor brands can run at about 130, 150 US. I know that sounds expensive for a lot of you listening in for the first time, but keep in consideration the fact that you buy it once, you take care of it, it could last you a lifetime. You buy these over years, imagine how much you spend and how much plastic you waste. So that's why I favor fountain pens. Uh, this one was a little bit more pricier. This this particular nib is actually customized for flex. So you'll notice a uh, complete variation of line that becomes a little bit heavier. Get the flow out just a bit more. So you don't want to press way too hard, but the line variance will be a lot more uh, generous using this particular pen. So I've just been playing with it. We'll see how it goes. I'm going to use it. Obviously, I don't want to press way too hard but you'll start to see there is quite a bit of line variation going on right now. <clears throat> Thanks for the um, advice, Cream Panas. I will make sure that is the case. Because I'm using OBS to, to restream channels, so if that's a problem, well, then they'll have to take me off affiliate. <laughs> so uh, I would rather stream multiple platforms than having this whole extra thing. So, um, so Cross Hatch has an interesting question. You know, the fact that you draw without any underdrawing doesn't it affect your design potential? Since most people sketch designs digitally and constantly experiment and try a lot of things. Very much true. And so when you look at this particular sketchbook, you'll notice that these are just straight pen drawings, you know, whether it's a, a bug that I studied from and then a bug that I drew, which is like a more character styling inspired by that bug. Now, is this design is a question and it's not 
because I'm not necessarily giving you uh, iterations or experimentations of proportion or shapes or story. This is just a drawing inspired by something that I saw in observation and I just created it. So I wouldn't call this a design piece. This is more of just a sketch or an illustration or a drawing or a study of an idea, right? Now, if I wanted to design this character, then obviously the material doesn't matter. I would be using things like digital, pens, pencils, whatever I'd want to use to explore that idea and the concept of the design. So the physical materials don't matter at that point, more about the concept of what you're trying to create. In my sketchbooks, because I'm just drawing out of my head and drawing things of observation, I stick to the pen because I just favor that tool. It's not the best tool. I'm not going to say that everybody should also use that tool. But I pref uh, preferably kind of use it because it's just comfortable that way. Um, but keep that in mind. There is a separation between that aspect of design processing towards just drawing, sketching, ideating, you know, and just putting stuff on paper. Um, the benefit of pen for me, again, is the idea of building confidence, committing to the drawing. But you are correct in the sense that this doesn't allow me to then show the many different potential directions of a design, right? So there's definitely a, a time and a place for something like that. And if I was working on something of a job, uh, then I would obviously place in that kind of mindset. Let me see a couple other questions and I'm going to start to go into the drawing, all right? I've been uh, trying to transition from pencil to pen. Seems uh, seem to make too many mistakes to be able to be confident enough. How do you tackle that? Well, stoic self, the idea is that that's the whole point, is that you're supposed to make those mistakes. And through those mistakes, you're supposed to repeat. Through repetition of that same drawing, you're supposed to hone in on the accuracy and more uh, control of that tool to be able to build the confidence towards it. So through a single drawing, would you be able to have the confidence to do it again? Maybe, but and you ha will you have the confidence fully of what you've produced? Most likely not. So hopefully in repetition, you would be able to build it, right? Um, Shaheen, the Goldbug Pasadena insects are real. Yes, they are. A question from uh, Bistonia is, when drilling your fundamentals, keeping design out of the picture, is it better to draw a head completely, review your mistakes and try and draw the next head better? Or is it better to review your mistakes and correct them within the same head and not stop until you can't see any flaws? So I think to repeat, to redraw the same angle, the same exact uh, shot, skull, whatever you're, you're studying from as a subject matter, to correct the mistakes but also to hone in on memory of building an understanding of what you are sketching as well too. Now that can be kept towards more details or kept very simplistic. So I'm going to be using the skull, using that same kind of the, the based on that question what Bistonian is asking of how you would want to study something like this because I don't want to just draw the details initially. I want to be able to interpret what's here in front of me. So I want to choose the appropriate angles and choose the appropriate shapes for me personally, uh, how it makes sense for myself. And then I'm going to put it on paper and we'll build some more details as we go. So let's see, uh, Sextus Cornelius asks, uh, is there any process you might recommend for drawing perspective, proportion, intense objects like modern sports cars or motorbikes with permanent ink? Use a marker, okay? For a lot of you guys that are building your understandings of proportion and perspective, I know that you want to just use straight pen, but I think using another tool to help you bridge that gap, a blank piece of paper is very scary and using just a pen can be very intimidating. But if you use the marker to help place in general shapes, then the pen on top, that's what I would recommend. Uh, Rogue Artist, in terms of the comic, uh, that will hopefully go on sale online and through potentially other gallery stores and bookstores into the future soon. Crosshatch, I'm not sure what the, uh, I know the one you're talking about from Proco, but I haven't really used that one before. This is from a different company. Uh, a cute dragon in terms of announcing on Instagram uh, I used to but these days I don't really why well, will I need to obviously um, but for the moment this time around I just kind of go straight on uh, the stream if anybody catches me they catch me if they don't they don't but I should obviously announce more so I'll make sure to do that in the future uh, Nian asks in Scott Robertson's book he talks a about sketching ideas of vehicles or aircraft before getting into perspective but in the book his sketch looks so refined and has precise perspective. Are the sketches supposed to look like that? No. Because you're talking about someone who's already studied those things for decades. So he understands what those things are and if he's just sketching them with you know th without this imperative you know 
focus of making sure perspective proportion is all really, really good is because he already understands it. So if you were to do that, should you expect yourself to do that also? Well, it's impossible. You haven't studied those things with the amount of time that Scott Robertson has, nor have I. So, um, but the thing is, a lot of things I do draw, I've studied over and over and over again. So even if I was to draw something, let's say a bug or a human or a character or a vehicle uh, for the first time, I can bring in those fundamentals because I'm used to drawing those other things too. Mateus, we'll see how it goes in terms of streaming. I've been notified that apparently Twitch is not favorable to uh, people streaming on multiple different platforms at once. Uh, if you're an affiliate, I guess. I don't know about that. I haven't read it. Uh, and if it's a problem, hopefully they'll notify me and then I'll adjust. So we'll see. <clears throat> uh, Ultra DMN asks, you might have done a video on this before, but what fundamental would you recommend for a beginner to learn regardless of medium? Uh, in terms of beginning, basic shapes of uh, circle, square. So actually, let me put those down real quickly too. The, the primitive core forms uh, that will establish always into the future. And the class that I teach called Dynamic Sketching encompasses these five core forms. So anything that we draw in observation, we should be able to construct using these primitive shapes. Now these shapes are limiting though. We can only do so much. Um, because again, they're stiff. And so we want to be able to manipulate the shapes to fit better towards things that we see, all right? So for instance, this skull right now, the cranial case might be a oval type shape. Some people use circles, some people use oval forms, egg shapes, whatever the case is. So that's not a circle for some people. So for here, I wanna be able to manipulate the sphere to become more spherical. So you can change and augment forms to match up the things that you'll see. <clears throat> So Jitin Yadav asks, I'm good at drawing shapes, now what to do? Apply them into observation. If you, know, if you can draw your shapes really well, draw now using those shapes and things that you can see. So Shaheen asks, I know your process includes organic shapes, but have you tried drawing uh, without organic shapes and drawing only with straight lines? So could I draw this skull with only geometric form? So instead of organic, right, we have organic. Organic could be a blobbish round shape, okay? Let me zoom in on this a little bit more. But then we also have the geo, the geo forms. And the geo forms could be something much more planal. Planes, right? Could I draw something like this, which is an organic subject matter, as something geoforms? Of course I could. Now, not everybody sees that, right? But let's try it out. We'll actually play with that. Danger Noodle asks, did you ever doubt, have doubts over your own passion for art? In terms of passion, no. But in terms of doubts of would I be able to make it? Sure, <laughs> absolutely. Because there were so many other better artists than me. And even now, there are artists that are far better than I am, too. Uh, but now has, over many number of years, have those doubts increased? No. Will those doubts always be there to some degree? Of course. I'm only human. So I'll always second guess sometimes things. I'll doubt, you know, my own self-confidence every now and again. Some people may make comments on stuff. And, you know, as people, we take things sometimes, you know, to heart. So we want to be better than, you know, um, as we put ourselves out there. But at the same time, even though that may be an aspect of who I am, the other side of it, the side of confidence of knowing what I can do, overpowers that. So you don't necessarily hide and shy away from those uh, thoughts of insecurities or doubts. You embrace them because that's just a part of who you are also. So in a lot of ways, it should hopefully strengthen you because that will drive you to even do more. I'm going to skip over a little bit. This, this um, questions are moving fast. So. Uh, what ink do I use? The current ink I'm using right now is the Sailor brand ink. Sailor, okay. Um, let's see, another question from Shane. His thoughts on draw a box? Uh, well, it's great. I, I trained the guy. So he took my classes and he's doing what I do now. And so he's doing his interpretation of it. Um, Fatalist asks, have you 
or would you ever consider releasing the book as a ebook? It just seems like the demand is far larger. I agree with you. The demand is quite large and I can't keep up with the number of orders sometimes. And a physical book, in my opinion, is always better, but I'm not necessarily against an ebook. I think after a certain amount of time, I may consider it in the future. But that's a, a, you know, the question is something on my mind for sure. So what do you think about students that have um, doubts in their passion? Well, it's normal. Everybody has doubts of many things. It could be about your drive, your future, your passion, your career choices, uh, even just, you know, the very moments of things. And that's okay. Like I said, it's never going to go away. But you can find ways to live with it, to grow with it. Uh, Felipe asks, what's the best way to learn anatomy? All of those things. Books, models, and photo references. Right now, we have an actual physical model reference of a skull, of a human skull, but using photographs and also then drawing real people are all good things. Okay, so now that I've answered a bunch of questions, let's actually just start sketching a little bit. I'm going to draw the skull. Uh, let's do a side view first. I really like doing side views a lot because I want to just be able to control proportions, uh, looking at the length of the skull, the height of it. So with this particular section of it, um, people, you know, we had a question again, it's like, do I need to always use rounded organic forms for this particular section? Not necessarily. Let's try drawing something that's a bit more geoform. Okay, so let's take the skull and let's draw something much more geometric. A shape that kind of represents this cranial area. Okay. I'm going to use lines to help me control groupings but also spacing of many things fatalist birds i would love to draw i'll do one next time uh, abinavar asks you know quick question how to use dynamic bible and animation well through animation the idea is that you you need to animate keys and so those drawings initially have to be very primitive to make sure the the angle the the accuracy of those uh, models as you're animating them are true. So drawing something more primitive as a basic shape would be very helpful to that side, which is what the Dynamic Bible is about, breaking down primitive forms. Uh, in terms of I see about the question of where the stream will go, right now my mainstream uh, live streaming approach is on Twitch, so they will be placed on there. And if you subscribe, you'll have full access to all the previous other streams, recordings, which are about two and a half hours long each. You'll notice this is the basic primitive shape of the skull again. We can even go more primitive. Let's just use a box. Instead of something that is cut up a little bit, let's just go for a box initially. Box here. So here's something even more primitive, okay? So based on these geometric shapes, I can continue to cut this thing apart and even adding things. The idea is that we have two words we can really use, addition, subtraction. So based on that uh, primitive shape, whether it's a box, you can always add more to things or you can cut away things, okay? So here, even with the skull, I'm gonna to continue to now add parts and also cut away parts. Once we've got, I mean, everything here right now is all straight lines, okay? Everything is geometric. From this, the idea of using straight lines, we can now add curvature. So the idea of anything that we draw as, let's say we drew the fender of a car, classic car, and this is what it looks like, okay? This is the fender of a classic car. Here's the front hood, here's the headlamps, here's the ground. But this curvature is really hard to draw. So what you can do is draw something more blockier. You can cut the shape out geometrically. Here's where the wheel goes. And you can add the curvature after the fact. 
So give yourself an idea of where it sits and you can curve things off after that. So here, even though everything is very geo, I can come back and start to round things off. Round things off. And as I round it off, it captures the organicness of the actual thing. which helps me be able to interpret things a little bit faster. But the most important thing from this is that I'm able to take something like that and memorize it as a process of how to draw. If I took away this skull and I wanted to draw from either my first study or draw from memory, I can just recreate that without having to see it because the process of steps of how I began was very simple. I started with a box, cut that in half, added to this shape, I knew the count of one, two, three, rule of thirds. I can start adding, I can start subtracting. To make it much more accurate as a skull like shape. But just to build the primitives of it, I don't need reference anymore because I've studied it. Now, of course, I've studied the skull many times, and I can draw that from memory. But for a lot of you guys who just drew it once, it may not be enough. You might have to draw it several more times, right? Of course, things like the teeth are you know, very difficult to draw. And what I want to put it in there, you could. Here's one of the things you can kind of think about. Well, first, think about the scale of the drawing. If the drawing was very small, like this one here, to place in the details that I would want to might be a little bit difficult because, again, it's such a small area to keep it really accurate. Now, if I increase the drawing much larger, I will be able to actually have the space to get the uh, nuances and the details of how to actually draw those specific parts. Now, based on that, you can also control what you want to draw and what you don't want to draw because the point of this particular exercise was showing you how simplistic the basic shapes need to be to construct the two most important things, the shape and proportion. So I want to just make sure the proportion of the skull was correct. I don't care about these small details because I can do more studies in the future to keep adding that information on. Let's try a different angle of view. Uh, let's keep this off to the side for the moment. Let me zoom out a little bit. Stoic self, building a library through grind is very much what it is. So yes, Warner C, uh, C3, drawing larger sometimes, okay? So don't try to cram in details in a small drawing because it's just not going to look very good. Steps Days asks, in your opinion, what would be a good balance of fundamental and composition design study routine? So in this situation, the composition design study is also a fundamental. Now, if you're saying a fundamental of, let's say, the early primitives of perspective, anatomy, uh, shape building, observation drawing, you know, um, even value, color, light is all a fundamental. Those are all things that are, you know, obviously practiced separately, but will need to be brought together at some point. But those fundamentals have to be used in composition, design, study routines is also a fundamental. So the idea is that you don't study one thing and leave it behind. Like, for example, we are studying the skull right now. And, I, and you might say, okay, I've spent a month studying the human skull. I'm done now. I'm going to now move over to studying this skull. But the thing is, you might treat this as a completely separate subject matter, but you can take what you learned from the previous version and apply it to here. So the idea is that whatever you studied from a month before needs to be brought into the next stages of fundamentals. It's not compartmentalized as one thing as to another. I'm studying perspective one month, and I'm going to study value now this month, and I'm going to study composition this month. As you separate all those things and don't think about the previous lessons, you'll forget them. And as you forget them, you don't apply it. And so you have to come back to it again. It's like, oh man, I completely forgot my perspective. I forgot my anatomy. I have to come back and retrain those things. But the idea is that you gotta be able to find a balance all those fundamentals together as you continue to move forward into the future, okay? So keep that in mind. It's not easy. It's actually very difficult. That's why these, um, you know, as many people wanna do it, it's not easy to accomplish. It takes a large amount of time to make sure all those fundamentals work together really well. And not, you're not going to be perfect at all of them either. I am not for sure. 
I'm terrible at things like light and color. Uh, I wasn't like that. I was more of a person of like line and shape. So there are other students that I know that focus more on light, you know, value, painting. And those fundamentals were not, you know, not necessarily super different, but they had a different focus. So some of them didn't draw as much as I did, where I drew more, but I didn't really paint. So again, I'm not, I don't consider myself a painter. <clears throat> I see as you know you're 16 now and I've been contemplating on when I should start trying to look for work or maybe you should wait until I'm older and start looking for work what kind of work are you talking about Ice-T are you talking about entertainment work or are you talking about just working in general Blaine you're asking how come the stream is free on Twitch it just is you can watch the past streams but those you have to be subscribed to but whenever I'm live it's free <clears throat> commissions and such okay so you're talking about like freelancing contracting work doing actual artwork for other people so in that situation there's never too late I mean not too late never too early either if you have an opportunity that comes your way and you feel confident enough to try do it absolutely for sure do it okay now could that be a full-time job potentially you can grow up to it but you're only 16 so you have all the time in the world to kind of build your understanding of fundamentals while you're also applying them to like actual opportunities of like commission work small freelance jobs and if people ask you hey can you draw me this character or can you do me this and maybe you go to a convention why not absolutely if you have fun with it too but it shouldn't be the focus of like a career or work the focus should be learning something because those commission and those jobs you can also learn from them too all right, let's do a front end of this skull. Move this up a little bit. Absolutely, as Ryan Villain states. Uh, do you have a preferred subject matter to draw? I do not. I favor the act of drawing more than the singular subjects that I need to sh you know, focus on. I think this pen is already kind of running dry because I use it up quite a bit today. Let me switch over to the other pen. Again, I'm sticking with geo shapes because somebody requested, can you draw organic things with straight lines? Yes, you can. And right now, I am not trying to draw the skull realistically. I'm just doing a quick study. We're gonna be doing a larger drawing in a second here with more details. For the moment, I'm just going through trying to understand, even though I've studied the skull many times again, but you should always go back to those primitives. Be humble in the sense that you always have to learn, relearn things again. My memory is not as good as most people might think. So I have to always go back and retrain my eyes to look for certain things. Let's do a three quarter view. How can I study color in fundamental ways? Observation. Set up lights within certain colors and see how they work on still life. Do you think art school is necessary? I know you talked about this a while ago, but I don't know when or what your answer was. And I do believe art schools are very important because it's not just about the lessons and techniques. It's about creating the sense of networking and community. You get to make friends, people that you know that might end up somewhere in the future. Uh, suggestions for good introductory pens. Something under $75 will be the Lamy. L-A-M-Y. Look for the safari. Kawikos are great. How long do you think people should spend on anatomy and the figure? I've been drawing, sorry, I missed that question. Uh, I've been drawing the figure anatomy for about four months now and kept switching style, so I have to try harder. Longer than four months, for sure. Four months is just the entry. You're only scratching the surface now. For if anything, figure anatomy is a lifetime. <laughs> lifetime. If you have to create a finished piece of something you never drew before, do you go about a similar process to develop it, is, or is it always different? Meaning, is there an order and steps you take to bring it to finish? Yes. Early study of research, um, sketching, 
you know, doing things like um, compositions, multiple, multiple thumbnails, and then from their approval processes, feedback, uh, which then goes into the stages of the finish. Tips on retaining what you learn and effective practice doing perspective right now, what you're doing at the moment, mileage. Keep doing it as much as you can. That's the only way. This nib size is an F. F. Uh, Aditya, if you go to my website on ArtStation, you'll find some work on there. Mostly sketches, but you'll find some stuff. I'm drawing it from a three-quarter view now. Again, primitives, primitives. Cutting this thing up, finding the orbital socket. Cheekbone right there. Mandible area, down to the chin. These are all basically grid lines or cross contour lines to give you the three dimensions of the shape and just building it. Okay, building blocks. Now I've just been using straight lines and geoforms. Let's use something a bit more organic now to a degree um, to control this. I'm actually gonna switch pens again. I'm gonna go to the felt tip fine liner tool. Question, uh, Ryan Villain, as does smoking marijuana affect one's ability to recall drawing from memory? Um, I don't know, maybe. I think some people might help them because it might relax you if anything else. You might be able to absorb information better. You never know. Will you be able to recall it? Uh, that's a whole other, you know, I would say practice. Try it. <laughs> Do I smoke while I draw? I don't. Uh, which teacher has the easiest style of teaching anatomy? I heard Bridgman was too technical, so which one would you prefer? For myself personally, I do like Hampton and also Loomis. Loomis I like because of the perspective stuff. I have never um, read the book on natural way to draw, but I will look it up, Ivan Bart. Thank you. Uh, Kad asks, I'm currently four months into Concept Art University course. Is there anything you would highly recommend doing in terms of drawing? Practice in my own time. Um, in that sense, apply the things you're learning right now. So if there are certain fundamentals, create things, stories, ideas, concepts, research heavily. Learn how to just research properly too. Drawing is one thing, painting is another, but the idea of being able to also research heavily and being able to understand how to organize information and lay things out in a, in a path that you can follow for design, I think would be a great lesson. Better to practice with roughs, William. Are you happy with six hours of sleep? Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's draw now. Um, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more. Let's draw a little bit larger this time. I'm gonna put the skull right here. And I'm gonna use a combination of shapes. Normally, I like to use much more rounded forms. Then applying things like planes. And we'll draw this relatively lightly at first. Top of the brow. Bottom of the nose. General construction of the head in place. <clears throat> Nian uh, asked, took my first figure drawing session the first time uh, yesterday, and I was confused by the gesture drawing exercise. Is there a right way to draw gesture, and what separates good and bad gesture drawing? Gesture is all about capturing the energy, the movement of the figure, uh, based on weight, gravity, but also central lines, and also the movement of your own arm, the actual expression of the line. Is there a right and a bad way to do it? Sometimes if you over-gesture, if you overemphasize line work, it becomes busy, so it feels erratic. So having a sense of control, uh, and it's almost like painting in a way where you control the strokes and the amount of strokes you actually use to be able to actually capture you know, things like planes or lighting or shadows. Uh, so gesture's not easy, but it is important to be able to capture movement. 
So, Obrogi is kind of the same idea. I use it to capture energy and movement. Uh, sketchy. Yes, I did use the balloon and string last uh, stream. So the question is, how do you do how to do with the human form by applying the same balloon and string method? But I can't seem to understand how. So imagine the idea that right now what I've drawn right here, this is the balloon. Okay. So the balloon, the string. So this is the head. This is the spine. Imagine if I drew the human head as a balloon, which is just a cranial shape. This right here. That's the balloon. Okay, from there I can apply, let's say, the gesture of a spine. I can even twist the body a little bit. But what I drew was the balloon, the string, the movement, which is a gesture potentially. I'm now twisting his body where his shoulders are coming this way and his hips are turning this way. Okay. Back to the skull. How do you practice better to train drawing in three-dimensional forms? By using the primitive shapes that we just talked about. So anything that we look at in observation, how do I convert that into something more three-dimensional using the core forms? Any tips on researching something to learn how to draw? Well, stick to your interests for now. From those interests, develop also other challenges or things that can be things that you're unfamiliar about. Stick to things that you actually know in terms of familiarity or even just base interest. And because as you break those things down, they can be married over to other things in subject matter. Ty, you know, in terms of that questioning, actually, it's quite important. The idea of how do you just sit, you know, it's like physically. Drawing can be physically demanding, much more than you might realize. For those of you that are just kind of beginning your guys' education or interest in art, You'll take it for granted, but the idea is that physically drawing is very tough, okay? Uh, it's, it's an endurance thing. You're sitting there for potentially hours. And so if, you don't, if you're not very mindful of the way you've actually uh, are sitting or posturing, you could put a lot of damage onto your body. As an example to that, I've actually put myself in a lot of uh, physical pain because I would sit there and I would kind of put my head down like this real low, and then I'll look into the angle of the drawing, and so I would be kind of like slanted to the side. And then from years of doing that at Art Center when I was in college, I actually uh, put a lot of strain on my neck and I had a lot of terrible neck pains during Art Center. It was also from a previous injury. Uh, but still, because of doing that, it actually, I actually had a crooked neck. Uh, and the only way I had, was able to solve it or alleviate it was from exercise, you know? Uh, but because I wasn't mindful of it, I actually built a lot of bad posturing and a lot of pain in my neck areas because of it. I've had to visit hospitals. I've been actually been able to, I've had to be driven to the hospital from Art Center because uh, I just couldn't move uh, after waking up from sleep. And I'd be given like Demerol shots, uh, muscle relaxants to be able to just sit there and just be able to gain momentum and movement again. It was hard, very hard stuff. GQM, uh, how do I get proportions of drawing right, especially in drawing uh, mechs? Study actual things, organic stuff. Imagine if I took the skull and you mechanized it. Imagine if you took an insect or an animal and you mechanized it. Use those proportions first, check, capture the accuracy of the real things, and then push things the way you want to. Great JF, in terms of visual library, repetition. Repeat this five times, ten times, twenty times. William, uh, I've had other artists criticize criticize my work for being different from theirs, so what is any advice for turning random criticism into useful constructive criticism? Well, I, I don't know if that criticism was valid in the first place. Just because it's different doesn't mean that theirs is better or yours is worse, or yours is better and theirs is worse. If it's a, if it's a styling thing, you have to understand that style is more married to the idea of what you're producing. What are you making? Then the style matters. But in that situation, it should be more talks of fundamentals potentially. They can talk about, well, this proportion or that shape or that perspective seems off. Here's how you can correct it. But if just telling you because your work is different, it's not good, 
that's not constructive criticism. That's not very helpful in a way. They should be able to tell you, well, it's different, but here's why, and here's how you can also think about it this way. So in that situation, take it from a grain of salt. It's like, don't take it so personally. Those people sometimes may not understand how to give proper criticism. They can only just talk about what they uh, understand from their own stuff. So sometimes there's limitations from the individual. So it's not your problem, okay? You're 17, Rogue Artist. Question is, how would you deal with nudity? Many of my family and close people feel uncomfortable seeing the anatomy uh, when you draw women and men. Well, it's natural. And to understand something, you have to see it. You can't just guess, right? And so it's academic. It's technical. It's through understanding of education. And that's what it is. Nudity, yeah, I understand that some people in the beginning, no matter what, it'll feel uncomfortable, right? You're seeing someone else in this very kind of weird, awkward situation where they're posed and you're trying to capture a drawing. So eventually, you will get used to it, okay? And so will other people that are understanding what you're doing. Eventually, when they see the application of it, the application proves why you have to do that previous stuff. In terms of the posture, by the way, I try to sit with my back straight now. I don't hunch over or, or lean in from one side. I'm always square on, okay? I will recommend that the height of your chair and the table is also a very important thing. Right now, I'm kind of high up, uh, looking downwards towards the table. I'm not really low to the table. But be mindful, physically. Take a lot of breaks, please. Don't hurt yourself over this stuff. Trust me, I've seen people that have long, if not lifelong, uh, ailments physically because of drawing. And it's not good. So here's one third, two thirds, thirds down here. Planes. So I'm now, again, deconstructing the skull into planes and shapes. We're now going to start to add a bit more details. This is a bigger sketch in the drawing. I'm now going to actually add things like the placement and the teeth. And in this situation, I'm only going to really call out a few of them. The rest of them will be just rows of shapes, long shapes. I'm going to start to make things a bit more organic. I'm going to round things off. I'm going to start to curve stuff. You start to see plane changes here. Orbital socket. Abhinavar, I'm not familiar with the artist's claim about the natural way to, uh, to draw. I don't know what that actually means. And I don't, only, I don't think there's only one way to draw. Uh, what I'm showing you right now is one possibility of how you can see things. But there's so many ways you can draw things because everyone's an individual. You all see things differently. I say, I see a circle. You might not. I don't see a circle. I see something else. Well, the question is, it's not about what shape or how you draw things or what method you look for. It's more in the sense of like, what is the easiest approach for you to actually place things on the page? So if it requires that method, this method, combining things together, whatever that may, creates the confidence within you to be able to produce things with the speed, efficiency, and confidence you need, I've said that already, um, please do so, right? Question things constantly. Okay, let me bring it down a little bit. Um, question from Blean is, am I joining NMA? I am, there are plans for it, but not till end of this year. Sorry, I'm just kind of scrolling through the chat. Again, I, can't, I apologize if I missed a bunch of questions. Um, A lot of people are commenting on this, uh, the draw box thing. Would I recommend it? Sure. If it helps you, great. Try it. Uh, draw box is an individual that, you know, was a student of mine. He took a class with me back in the day at CDA. Um, and he asked permission from me if he could take that content, my content that I taught, and there was an interpretation of it. And I said, yeah, that's fine.
So again, I do apologize if I missed a bunch of questions. I just kind of scrolled down the chat to catch up to current um, what people are saying. So if anybody wants to repeat something, if I didn't answer it, if it's pertinent, please do so. If people are helping each other out with answers and questions, that would be great for me. I will try to get to as many questions as I can, uh, but I don't want to necessarily stop drawing either. These streams, live sessions, were mostly just for me to draw. Just have an opportunity to be able to just sketch. Because I sketch all the time, uh, but to be able to just share you know, and talk and comment on stuff. Because I'm going to do it anyways. And then, you know, I post the drawings on Instagram or whatever the case is. But I think people like to see how things are actually done. Um, you know, from an artist's perspective who's worked in the industry and draws all the time. <clears throat> Great TJ. Uh, JF asks, is it better, it's better to draw a subject from photos or in person? Uh, there is any different at all? So right now we have a actual physical object of a skull. If I drew from a photograph, is that, is one better than the other? Not necessarily, but it can matter based on how you look at it, okay? By this physical object, I can look at it from multiple angles of use. I can interact with it. I can kind of see how things work, okay? Um, if I looked at a photograph and you found, let's say, even just five, ten different photographs of different angles of views. You still don't have a three dimensions of that object, okay? It's a two-dimensional picture representing a three-dimensional object. So you have to be able to interpret that in three dimensions, which is much tougher. And in photographs, what happens is that you just copy the photograph. Here, I can understand the light and how the light works on top of planes and, and shapes. So my mind is focused on breaking things down. Uh, do you like George Bridgman approach for human figure? Do you have any preference when it comes when it's about human figure at all? I mean, yeah, I've looked at Bridgman, I've looked at Loomis, I've looked at you know uh, Ho Hogarth, I've looked at you know all these other guys, and they're all great in my opinion. They all have something that I think can be very beneficial. Guys like even Glenn Dilpu, I think, are great. Um, the idea is to expose yourself to as many different opinions and methods and possibilities of drawing the, something as complex as the human figure as you can. Uh, that way, you, you are able to then judge for yourself what works and what doesn't, okay? So here, I'm now starting to kind of block in some of the shadow shapes, all right? Going in there, separating some of the inside deep shadow forms, maybe some of the core shadows here too. And I'm just using one simple hatching method to just group them together. So I'm grouping all my shadow shapes and I'll use value separation to go darker in some parts again I can use hatching to show plane changes Uh, coming back to some of the questions here, Danny asks, uh, glad to see you again uh, right now. The thing right now is that I can draw good copying from references like studies, but when I try to do it from imagination, I just can't. But most of the problem is that I can't imagine anything to draw. It's like I don't have creativity and advice. Uh, it's not the fact that you lack creativity. You lack the fuel to inspire your imagination. So you should draw more from referencing. You should draw more from observation. From that, take away those references and things of observation. Draw from memory. Recreate a lot of things you've seen. As you then uh, see many, many things, try augmenting them. But when it comes to imagination, the idea is based on things like story, function. What are you, you know, creating it for? Uh, give it a sense of like context as to what you're drawing, and it might give you some ideas. Okay. Okay. Uh, should I use other artists' work as reference when creating stylized characters? Sure, absolutely. We do it all the time in the industry. We, uh, we look at and compare and contrast other brands and other styles to see what we want to compare to and what we also don't want to be as well. As a student, as a young person, should you study those just to get a better understanding of how they stylize stuff? Of course. When doing practice studies, which is more important, aesthetic or accuracy? Accuracy. From there, line quality, aesthetic purposes of rendering, surfacing, hatching will come on top of that initial accuracy of proportion and shape. This is Mystic Matron. 
Um, bum. So Bistonian asks, do you, do you do any eye measurement accuracy and proportion drills before you started learning perspective or did those develop naturally? For me, I would say, to be honest, it developed naturally over time by just doing it. But I also messed it up a lot in the beginning. Okay. So I'm going to keep sketching here a little bit and I'll continue to come back to some of the questions. If anybody can continue to uh, answer any questions that they, they think they can help on, please do so. Would appreciate that. Based on how this session goes, because we have a lot of people from different platforms asking questions, uh, again, depending on the fact that I'm, hopefully I'm engaging enough and answering as many questions as I can. But if it becomes a bit overbearing, uh, I might just recommend people to jump over to Twitch. I might just keep it on there, but um, we'll see. For people listening for the first time, there are a couple of um, individuals here following me on Twitch that are former students or people that have been watching for some time. So uh, if they do reply to some answers, uh, do understand that there are some people in here that you know can be helpful. Well, most everyone here has been helpful. So again, I do appreciate that. Again, kind of scrolling down a little bit, sorry. Here's an interesting question, Helen in town. Um, so I've always had an interest in seeking a career in art, but I've been burnt out by bad schools, teachers, financially, emotionally. Now I'm finding all these wonderful resources online that I'm learning a lot from. I'm obviously going to continue drawing. Uh, is mid-30s too late to pursue a career? What do you guys think, generally? Uh, no, it's not too late. It's never too late. The fact is, yes, you've been burned a little bit by bad education, maybe some individuals that didn't really get, give you a guidance that you needed. But, you know, there's no guarantee by going to a certain school or having some individuals you're working with that they're going to give you all the answers or the path and the follow that will help be successful. But the fact of the matter is that you can only try, right? Uh, and the fact is now that you have an opinion about stuff based on where you've been to or how you might want to uh, learn or who it is you want to engage with, uh, and with more time invested, you'll start to get a better idea of what you want to hone in on. So now you might think, but I feel like I'm spending too much time now. Time is moving faster. I'm getting older. Is it going to be too late? No, it won't be because the industry is not going anywhere. Okay. And the only thing you have to practice and focus on is your ability and skill to become as competitive as possible. And it might take you longer than you like, but if you're unwilling to commit that amount of time, well, I guarantee you someone else is. But again, it doesn't matter what the age is supposed to be because as you apply for work or you start to get opportunities, they don't ask you, how old are you? Oh, you're too young or too old, you can't work here. That doesn't really work that way. Now, of course, you could be too young, I would say, but is there too old? No. Uh, Asai, I will be streaming for, right now it's nine o'clock. I started around eight. We've been going for, how long now? About an hour, so I'm going to be going for another hour and a half or so. Never too late to start, as everyone is kind of stating here. Awesome. Okay, so you can start to see this skull. I'm developing some of the shadow areas now more just using simple hatching to kind of block in all these elements but you'll notice that the underlying building construction is still there but it doesn't really become as uh you know evident or in the way and so that's why constructing is so very important that when you let's say you took a class of mine at art center uh, it was like basic sketching drawing classes i want people to show me how they built things how did you construct this stuff so you don't want to just show me how you can draw it very you know beautifully or aesthetically because I'm not really interested in that. I'm more interested in the beginning. How did you start? I don't care how you finish a drawing. You can always be made better. I can keep practicing and make this drawing better also. I'm not perfect at it, but obviously with more and more time, I start to become stronger, more confident, whatever the case is. So when people take my class, they're so worried about the way it looks, but I'm not. 
because I am more interested in seeing how you just began. What is your mindset? What did you think of? What were you seeing initially? Can you share me you know, that information as you draw? And if you're able to do so, uh, your mindset alters a little bit. Well, hopefully a lot, if anything else. How to do networking when you're a self-taught artist. It's a very difficult um, thing to pursue. I understand. As a self-taught artist, as you're independent, and you want to network and connect to people out there, it's like, where do you even just start? Especially if you're in a location where things just don't happen. You don't have schools, you don't have gallery shows, you don't have conventions. Like, where do you go? Well, right here, obviously, right? Social media, online, and you might think, but there's so much noise. I can't stand out. I don't produce work that can be shown. I, I don't know how to connect to people. I I'm shy. Even that can come up, right? I understand. Uh, and, and these are situations that into the future as you grow, you'll need to then control. So if you stay where you are and you're trying to network and you can go online, but it's only going to take you so far. You have to meet people in real life sometimes too. Put yourself in a position or go to areas where people congregate. So maybe you can travel a little bit. You might think, but I don't have the money right now. Well, give yourself time and build that finance. Maybe you can take a summer at some point in a year, two years. Visit places like LA or places in you know Europe or places in Asia that do these kinds of you know big events or schools and classes and go to them. You know, um, be patient with it, and hopefully you can find an opportunity that will pop up for something like that. Well, only by being there will you have opportunities to actually engage with people in person. Because when you have someone online, you don't know who they really are, so everybody puts up a guard. Okay, but if you're there in person, you get to show who you really are at that point, and people are more open to be able to communicate and build a network with you. If someone started drawing around 18 and is dedicated to becoming a pro, how long do you think it will take? And un there's no way to know. There isn't. I couldn't even, you said, just give me a number. Okay, 10 years. <laughs> All right, 15, 20, pick a number, you know, because each individual grows differently. Each individual has different opportunities. You could be someone who's highly skilled, but maybe you just don't get the opportunity. I know people like that, that are really, really good at what they do, but they never had the break. So do you think it's because they lack sk uh, skill sets? No, it's just life. That's the way it works, right? So hopefully by then, uh, giving yourself that you, you build up enough skill set, you build a good networking by hopefully, by putting yourself out there and hustling, you'll get that opportunity that pops up through chance and luck, which is a part of the game, you know? And that's not everything that dictates your success. But it definitely is a part of it, being at the right place at the right time. Um, do I have any direct mental practices like meditation? No. Drawing for me is a part of that. I actually gain energy and enthusiasm through drawing. Drawing is not stressful. It's not supposed to be. It should be relaxing, but I understand that most people find it very anxious. It builds a lot of stress, right? Because you want the drawing to be something good. But it doesn't need to be. A drawing is something of just of personal satisfaction or or study or um, you know determined towards a focus of a product. But it could also be something that you just do because it relieves you, right? And so no matter what it looks like, maybe you actually can get into that kind of practice also. I don't care what this drawing looks like. It may not be the best, and people will have criticism. Oh, what about that part? That part? That line? Whatever. Okay, say it. But. I will just do another drawing. Hopefully, it'll get be get better. Uh, let's see. Okay, sorry, it's catching up more to the chat. Most of my peer artists seem to have an elitist attitude. So, how do I cultivate relationships in a culture where everyone is stand trying to stand out? Uh, it is, and that's unfortunately in your situation, Mystic Matron, you're in a position where uh, right now it is very hard in that sense. Let me tell you the current situation right now of the industry is that there's a lot of work out there, okay? The, the possibility of getting opportunities is way better now than it was for us back 20 years ago, all right? And the reason is because there's just that many more projects. But there's also the flip side to it. It's also really tough because you now have that many more people wanting to do it.
But now you have the advent of social media and you have that level of competition and it's just so overstimulating, so much over information. You don't even know where to go anymore, right? So people are lost. Even though you see it out there that all these people are making it, it's like, what do I do? It's like, there's so much opportunity, but I don't even know where to begin. And so you turn to things like Instagram or Twitch or these live streams or different, different artists, and you don't even know who's right or who's wrong or who's good or who's bad. And then everyone's you know, yelling at each other and arguing, this is the right way, that's the right way. Um, you know, there's so many opinions now too. And then of course now everyone is that much more sensitive. When somebody criticizes something, you say, oh man, no, I, you know, I don't want to hear that. But then you don't even know who to listen to at that point either, right? So that's really, I, again, like I said, I don't envy your position, unfortunately. Uh, what I, if, if I had the choice, would I want to be a young artist today? And I'll be very honest with you, no, I wouldn't. I'm happy I started 20 years ago <laughs> because, you know, back then it was simpler. We just built a portfolio. We found the company that we liked or an industry we wanted to go for. We had competition within our friends and colleges, and we looked for work, and we worked. And, you know, obviously over time, a lot of my friends and Myself have built up a brand and direction as to what we want to encourage on. So do I have to learn things like 3D? Not necessarily the work because people find me for the work that uh, I do. I don't have to necessarily look for work that I have to do for them in their styling, right? Um, and so it's, it's a huge benefit for my end, but it took me 20 years to get there, right? But for right now, for a young artist coming out of school, it's, it's again, like I said, it can be difficult because of that aspect networking, you know, uh, building a work portfolio that stands out, having the right mindset. And right now it's become a very much, you know, w I mean, it's always been that way, which is the me mentality. What about me? But there's another aspect that I feel like is missing a little bit, especially in colleges and schools that I feel like is uh, not being taught enough, which is being able to work in teams, work together. Because back when we were in colleges, we were always forced to work in projects where we had numbers of people together on the project. Because then you found your strengths, you also found your weaknesses. You understood what you, you, you had to do and what you couldn't do. And you relied on other people to help you with that. Um, no project in the industry, animation, games, is done by one person. It's a combination of you know, all these people from designers to you know, um, storytellers and animators and texture artists and 3D modelers together to help develop this product to get it out there. So when you're saying that I need to be the best and put this portfolio together to work in this field, well, you got to also be a team player. You got to understand how to work with people as, as well, too. Just because you can draw really well doesn't guarantee you a job either. Because you can find another person next to you that can draw just as good, if not better. There are people out there that can draw way better than me. But I'm also mindful of knowing how to work with people. I can work in teams. I know how to criticize. I also know how to take criticism. So companies would hire me because they know they can develop and work with me in a long period of time. But if I can draw really well, but if I'm an asshole, would they want to hire you? If I'm elitist minded or selfish and I said, you know, I can draw awesome. Now you guys are suck. Hire me because I'm the best. They wouldn't want to hire you. Now you got to work with that person for two years in an office in a, in a table next to you. Those people wouldn't want you there. Okay. So technical skill only takes you so far. That's the idea. It only takes you so far and you can always learn more, even on the job. You only get good enough, okay? You get good enough to be competitive, to show that you have the ability to continue growing. That studio will see it, has the potential of seeing who you are as a person. They can bring you in and train you and you'll continue to grow, working with people that are seniors above you and then also being able to teach people under you. But if you're not mindful of that part of the social aspect of it, and you're only worried about, I just have to learn how to draw perspective really good. I got to know anatomy really well. I just want my drawings to be the best. That's the wrong thinking, in my opinion. Those are important, but that's not the primary goal. So that's why schools like colleges have the benefit, because it gives you the opportunity to work with people. When you go to classes like Schoolism, CGMA, all these independent schools that are out there, it's good technical information, but it doesn't give you the opportunity to work in teams in long runs of times. You might have one class, you work with some people, you never see them again. But if you go to a school, like a college university, four years you might be with those people, you go through the ranks and you also fight a war with them. So I'm not saying that going to college is the answer though, right? Because it's not always the answer for everyone. But that's the benefit of those potential opportunities. But you can build that environment yourself, even online. Make good friends, make good contacts, find work that you like, build a relationship, be mindful, 
and then you guys can do your own like discords you guys can also do your own you know challenges work together develop projects that's a part of it you can do it online too So, good question from Shemi is, do you think your art friends motivate you at some level, at extreme levels? The, the only reason why a lot of us are where we are is because of each other. When I met my friends, you know, 15, what, more than 15 years ago at Art Center, these are becoming people that are not only just lifelong friends, but they were also obviously competition, but then also connections. I know people in every part of the industry, you know. But the thing is, I may not have worked on every one of those industries, but I know how they work because they tell me. And then I can get inside information. I can see how things are running. I can see what's popular. I can see the trends. Uh, but they're also just friends, right? So the college I went to, the benefit of it was not paying for the education of the technical information. Because right now, that technical information that you can get much cheaper is just as good as like any university. And I would recommend that. But the things I wouldn't have gotten is being actually in that trenches, you know, working with all my friends next to me, staying up till three or four in the morning every single night working for hours on end developing our skills because now there are people that i can turn to that level of connection is priceless <clears throat> do you have any exercise routines for your wrist thumb uh, fingers whatever the case is i feel like my hands are under more strain these days uh there are a few things one of them let me get that tool real quickly one second This thing right here is for uh, rock climbers. It's called the Grip Master. And you can get them in multiple different weights. This one is at X heavy. So you put this in your hand to be able to individually strengthen fingers. So I use this to you know, strengthen grip strength. This really helps a lot with the fingers, but it also really helps a lot with the forearm. Um, so doing any kind of like exercise I think can be really good, especially something like this. Um, you can get ones that are like springs on them that you can just crush. Uh, doing stretches are very helpful too, but something like this is cheap. I got it at REI for like 15 bucks or something like that. I've overworked the skull, so I'm done now here. <laughs> Anyways, here's a, a really quick study of a skull form, which we started with this, understanding organic geoforms, breakdown primitives, trying to get the proportions, building geoforms at the initial start, uh, and then pushing something with more detail. All right. I had not tried crunching sand and rice. Sounds cool though. Sarah, thank you for the suggestion. I'll try to find out how I would actually do that. <laughs> so um, I'll figure it out. I might even get some people that have uh, been a part of the stream, even people that I work with, maybe like Kevin, to help me out modding stuff like this. So Texture demo is something I can maybe apply onto the same drawing, okay? All right, uh, let me adjust the camera a little bit and see where I want this. I'm going to begin with the fountain pen. <clears throat> from Danny, for learning and improving, do you think the student should focus more on creating things from imagination or just focusing on studies and copying stuff from real life? Well, the idea is that you have to find a way to bridge the two things together. You gotta focus on being able to actually draw from observation, but from those observations of things that you look at, you have to apply it to drawing from the imagination, creating a design, let's say, right? Oh, I see. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, this skull was a gift from the company who made it. Um, it's, I think it's 3D Total. I think that's the company. Uh, somebody was asking about the underside of the skull. I mean, it, it, the idea is the same thing where I'm just drawing basic primitive forms. I don't even honestly need this, but um, where you can then actually just construct planes. understanding 
these kind of planal breakdowns. Is what will help you the most in being able to capture that angle of view. Again, this is a really quick, simple, you know, fast view of it. But the idea is that you can always build a simple shape and a planal structure that shows you the underside of something. Or from a down angle view. Which is this idea, the combination of a spherical cranial shape in this front section, which is the lower mandible in the front of the face. So this one to two, these sections, is what you'll need to be able to turn around in multiple angles of use. The model of Arteza pen I'm using right now is the 0.4 fine liner. Is it better to know, uh, only to know the shapes of the muscles and the names? Well, I think you should understand the, the base, the big muscles first, and you should know the names of those. The small stuff, not as much. Um, Hyena, in terms of the classes, a cheap method than CGMA, um, this, <laughs> this is free. Can you explain how not to get uh, bored while studying fundamental things, like perspective, for example? Every time I draw, try approaching it, uh, it gets like, now I'm bored. Uh, then I fail at some point and get back to basics. So, well, that's the thing is that you have to basically be able to be disciplined enough to stick with it. Yes, it is boring, the fundamentals, but you have to stick with it as much as you can. Is there a way to make it fun? I mean, you could draw things that are subject matter wise interesting for you. That's about it, though, right? But every fundamental is always boring or somewhat strenuous and right not interesting enough. Uh, let's sketch something here. I think what we'll do is draw uh, a character-like piece using the inspiration of what we saw here. Maybe even integrating a skull like this one into some sort of like crazy bone character-like thing. All right. So let's see. Ah, okay. So before I start drawing, let me actually even just talk to you guys about where my mind is going, all right? Before I sketch, uh, what I just told you was that I'm gonna create a character based on something I just studied from. I also have this skull to look at too. Now people wonder, it's like, how do you draw from the imagination, right? It's like, how do you just begin? Well, I'm pulling a lot from memory. I'm pulling a lot from experiences of things that I looked at, read, movies, whatever the case is. This is a bobcat skull. So in my head, what I just imagined and visualized right now is some kind of like ethereal bone skeletal like character over on this side and another character looking up at him. That was the first thing that just came into my head. Now, how did that actually happen? Well, I think a lot of it was just stimulated from things that I've either experienced or seen before. That's a part of it. Another part of it is I imagined this very kind of like um, intimidating figure, a skeletal like kind of like almost like death in a way, right? Um, so that's where my head was going. And so I'm using elements of how we can connect to it culturally, but then also maybe story-wise. So I'm gonna now do a drawing, and I'm gonna do like a skeletal, almost like bobcat skull, like demon-like character over here rising up, and there's gonna be another character below him looking up at him, all right? That's where my mind was going right now, very much at the moment. Where's a good place to buy skull replicas? Go to boneclones.com. This is a real skull. All right, let's place in. And I'll zoom in a little bit actually, so you can kind of see where I'm starting. And I do apologize again if I do miss a bunch of questions, but I am now looking down and drawing a little bit. And I'll look back up and read some of the questions again in a minute. He's going to have glowing eyes inside. <clears throat>
do apologize if the voice starts to get a little bit hoarse as I talk. I'm not naturally built to project and speak aloud. So when I teach classes at the Art Center, uh, at the end of the day, I'm usually spent, like my, my voice is gone uh, because it takes a lot of energy for me to actually project my voice. So if it's a little bit faint right now, uh, I'll keep trying to project more. How's it going, Jen? Welcome. And anybody who's joining right now internationally, different parts of the country, again, welcome. I appreciate you guys stopping by. Uh, I'm sure it's early or late for a lot of you, um, but thanks for choosing to spend time here with me and with everybody else where you have a lot of other options of streams or content that you can look at. Um, but like I said, hopefully you guys have got something from this a little bit for yourself. I started this practice of drawing a 10,000 figure drawings and did, did it uh, in 50 drawings every day. I have learned a lot. Is it too much of one thing I did? No, it's amazing. If you really did that many drawings, fantastic, congratulations. Keep it up as much as you can, but don't burn yourself out. You know, the way I treat these kind of live streams, I understand there's a lot of things I could set up here. Um, and I know I'm missing, I'm probably making things a lot harder for me than, <laughs> than I need to. Uh, but I treat them very much like how I treat my classes where I want to re-explain, you know, answers. I want to talk about things again when people ask certain questions that I've been asked before. Um, because it's one thing to hear a reply that's very kind of like standard. But I think you need to hear it from the words from the individual who's, who's said it before uh, because I think it, it's different in how you take it, you know? Uh, I know some things can be very much just factual information, just be like point A to point B. Um, but a lot of things I'm also not just about technical, but how I just feel about them. Even if when people ask about tools, you know, it's like, what pen are you, at, you know, drawing? I understand that's a very common question and there are certain facts and things I've replied to, but I don't mind talking about them because I'm, I love talking about tools. I love talking about techniques of that kind of, you know, different things to look at and try and experiment with because yes, I am that much passionate about those things too, you know? But like I said, if for some of you who have asked questions, if I missed them, just try to ask again. Um, I don't always catch all of them, and some questions I have to either move on from or consider the importance of others as well. So, IG is um, Peter Han style. He's gonna have his arm up like this. Ah, uh, you know what? He's gonna carry a light right down here, almost as if he's guiding somebody. Ah, okay, so a new idea. So I had this character with a head coming up with a skull. He's gonna be in robes and a bunch of like interesting cultural elements. He's gonna be holding some kind of light system and he's have another character here following him. So it's almost like he's guiding him through something. Kind of like the, uh, the River of Sticks character, right? The boatman. Let me zoom in a little bit more. Oh yeah, you know, as you're saying, part of streaming is repeating yourself a lot. And I'm very much used to that because the classes I teach are fundamental based. So I have to repeat things over and over and over again on the lessons of what I'm teaching. So, you know, a lot of my friends tell me, it's like, aren't you bored of that class anymore? It's like after teaching it for 10 years, dynamic sketching at Art Center or other places, don't you tire of talking about the same subject matter over and over and over again? Don't you get tired of drawing the same thing over and over and over again? And I don't. 
because I like drawing those things, but also I find new things about them, about how to approach it, or the the story behind them, the biology, the functions, the history, the culture, uh, and it makes me curious about other stuff as well too. So that's why I really favor the class that I teach because it's constantly stimulating me with new ideas. But I grow and learn from the students too. As people see it the way uniquely in how they see it, it, it alters my perspective also. So question from Talimera is, do you think one should buy a simple drawing table as a beginner? Yeah, I mean, for me personally, I'm just using an IKEA table for my computer and drawing surfacing. I don't have fancy, um, you know, space within my apartment or having you know, all these like drawing tables and areas. I even just draw on the couch. I'll even draw on my bed. I just sketch anywhere I want to. Sometimes I'll just step out of my house and I'll go to like a cafe and I'll draw there. Um, so yeah, it, it's always something that I, I'm altering. Would I recommend something like that to set up for yourself? Of course, if, even if it's just a basic one. Uh, any location you can actually have a place to feel comfortable to just start drawing and creating, please. Uh, what anatomy books do you recommend to study with the dynamic Bible? Is Michael Hampton's book, uh, Analytical Anatomy Book, a good match for your book? Hyena, unfortunately, I don't really know his book in extreme details. Uh, but any anatomy book, especially either from Hampton, uh, I think would be a good study. I've shared a book from before. It's a Barsky book. Uh, which more strictly just straight anatomy. Barsky is the artist and the author for it. Uh, and that book's been around for a long time. Best way to learn clothing, Awoken Samurai, is to think of it as planes of shapes that are basically draping around subject matter so look at real life set up still life situations okay so take fabric cloth wrap it around things like chairs draw from observation see how the wrinkles and the folds work treat it like ribbons thank you guys for supporting answering questions <clears throat> So, Grimlock asks, if we can conjure complex images in our dreams, why do we need to commit references to memory? We already know what the things look like. How do we access what we already know? Um, you know, that particular question is tricky because if you know what those things look like, that doesn't necessarily mean you can actually use them in ways for imagination. Um, and if you're limited on how much you've seen also, you're going to need reference for it at some point, but then also the memory can fade as you are detailing something you've seen before, you might forget certain nuances about it, which is why you have to come back to some references or even just practice the fundamentals again. Um, but there's the other side of it, where as you are the artist, so you can alter and change things the way you want to. It's your piece, and nobody can argue that. So that's also you being a part of a creative and using the things that you do know, right? Um, so how do we actually access what we already know? Through constant practice. That's, I know that's an artist's typical response, mileage, practice, do it again over and over, but there's no shortcut at that point. It's just being able to put yourself in a position to always find a way to practice and apply it to some degree. Recently bought a Wacom Cintiq 16, but never used. I have never used one. Can you post a video on how to use it? So. I-74, uh, I'm sorry, LE-74, I actually do have a review on the Cintiq 16 on my uh, YouTube channel. I'm having a real trouble figuring out, on, figuring out how to make sure everything is to scale and properly understanding vanishing points when drawing. Something always just feels off. Any tips? In that situation, again, I think using references is a huge part of it. Uh, thumbnailing. So thumbnail multiple pieces to get something as accurate as you can. Use that thumbnail to then do a larger piece and maintain accuracy. Okay. So to add to what Grimlock is saying, it sounds like we have easier access to references than we do our subconscious. Does that make sense? Well, I would say so. I mean, here's the thing. It's like, I don't remember my dreams, okay? Uh, I barely remember them. I mean, I'll get up and I, I go to sleep and I wake up and I don't remember anything I've dreamt about. I'm not saying I don't dream. I'm just saying I don't really remember them, you know? Um, for
for people that do dream, I'm actually very envious about them because they have so many crazy images and stuff like that. And I've talked about this in the stream before, but my dreams, and if I do remember them, are extremely mundane. It's literally me dreams of like standing in line at a store, you know, dreams of like uh, being at a museum, walking around. It's usually connected to something I did today. <laughs> uh, so it's probably just using memory of experience that I haven't actually gone through, obviously. But it's the same thing. It's just, you know, stuff from observation, things I've just gone through over and over again. But references are highly important. Okay. What's an exercise you would suggest to an average artist? Well, being able to just um, control your tools in a more competent way. Muscle memory. And muscle memory is like just physical exercise. Constant repetition. Lines, circles, shapes. Being able to control them consistently to produce the same line, to produce the same shape over and over and over again. Where then eventually it becomes second nature and you don't have to sit there thinking about what it is and how you need to do it, but your hand just does it. Out of curiosity, oh, I'm sorry. What's the toughest thing you came to realize in your years of teaching at Art Center or anywhere else? Um, mm -hmm. It's a tough question, actually. It's a good one, too. But in terms of the toughest thing I came to realize was actually very early on was how do I make what I'm teaching my own thing? Because when I taught in the beginning, this method that I'm teaching right now came from a different individual, my instructor, my mentor. And he taught this for many number of years. And so when I took it with him at Art Center, obviously I learned a lot and I followed him and, and you know, taught with him, TA for him many times and, you know, got approval from him to be able to take the class out. But it was still always his method, you know, and every time I taught it, I thought about how would he say, you know, explain this? What would he draw? What would he say in response to those questions? So my mind was always trying to put myself in his situation or his place. But that's not the way to do it because I am not him. I'm not my mentor. And no matter how good he was or, you know, um, like I said, as an example to other people, he was very influential, especially in our area of the community of Art Center. Uh, he was very popular. So after his passing, you know, all I could really think about was, like, I want to make sure I do him justice so that people that ask me questions or interact with me feel like I know what I'm talking about, right? So those were some of the self-doubts and, and uh, fears that I had teaching earlier on when I was only 28. I started teaching about 28, 29, you know? This is in 2010, so 10 years ago. And I'm 38 right now. So in my late 20s, did I want to teach? It didn't matter. That opportunity fell on my lap because my mentor was killed. So now I have to like, take it or don't. I can't say no. Art Center said, hey, can you teach his class for us? You knew him, you knew this process. How could I say no, right? No matter how I felt, no matter how scared or afraid of, you know, being in his shoes, I would have been. So in the beginning for the first year, that's how I taught, you know, it's like, what would he do? What would he say? How would he draw this? But people can see through that instantly. The students can tell it's like, man, you know, this, it shows the insecurity and what, you know, everyone's being nice and everyone's following along and, and, you know, they're listening, but that's the same thing. It's like, in my mind, I see it very differently, you know, but I had to be able to overcome that. And the way to overcome it was to accept the fact that this was not teaching what Norm would have taught or how he would have said things. I got to now do it the way I want to do it, you know? So yes, the fundamentals, the foundations of what I'm teaching are part of his uh, foundations that he established, which I call the echo of my mentor, the echo of Norm. But now this is my class. This is how I teach things. This is how I need to explain it. But I learned a lot from that. Do I still do the thing where I pretend to be the student the first day? No, not anymore. It doesn't work anymore. Because a lot of the students that come into the Art Center are like 18, 19. 
I don't look 18, 19 years old anymore. I know I look young. Everyone says like, man, you look so young than your age. But I don't look like an 18 year old, you know? So uh, I can't just sit there and be like, oh, where's the instructor? It doesn't work. And everybody kind of knows that art center who I am now. So a lot of the students that come in are already like a second, third year. So they already, they already know about my class. Do I mainly draw or do you also uh, paint or other techniques? I do. So when I work on actual contract jobs for companies, I actually mainly do digital. Digital painting, digital drawing, because change needs to happen very fast. And usually every year I work on about three or four projects. Uh, this last year, 2019, I worked on um, an animation. I worked on a couple of video games. A lot of them are still uh, in development, so they're under NDA, so I can't share any of that stuff. Um, but so yeah, I still work professionally now. Well, here's the thing, Taibu, is that I may look young enough now, but with Asians, you get to a certain age and then you do wrinkle up, uh, right? Like crazy. It becomes like the whole Indiana Jones scene where the guy's, you know, drinking from the, <laughs> the cup of Christ, uh, the Holy Grail, and then he turns into a husk, right? But you know what though, you know, that's, it's different now because the, the Asian people that we see as old as our previous generation, our parents and grandparents, but my generation, us in our 20s and 30s, we're going to be different when we get older. We might not shrivel up like our parents did. <laughs> do you do any personal work that primarily has an emotional motivation behind it, like an attempt to capture a feeling or interpreting a past experience through your art? So yeah, uh, my recent graphic novel that I wrote and drew polls from my previous experiences, from mentorships to from teaching to authoritative figures, uh, my mentor, you know, so the story actually does pull from that, which I'm very emotionally connected to. Yeah, Norn's book is awesome. I'm glad you have that. Uh, Karitaal. Norn's book is called To Draw Is To See, and you can get it on blurb.com. Essentially, it's a collection of just Norm's work. When he passed away, um, friends got together, scanned a lot of his work, and we just produced an art book. It's not instructional, but it does have a lot of great drawings in them. It's called To Draw Is To See on blurb.com. So I don't know about salt and pepper hair. I'll probably lose my hair if anything else. I just saw a photograph of my grandfather uh, just recently, a couple days ago. My dad is in town. My grandfather passed away in 1988, a uh, long, long time ago. And he was already in his 80s. So um, a couple of my grandparents were very old. But he was bald, so I'm pretty sure I will be. <laughs> Uh, some to sub, did you get to try the Pilot Falcon at Labo? I haven't, but I do have this one, which is the uh, Pilot uh, Custom 912. And this is a Flex Nib, which is really nice. Actually, I'm going to refill this one real quickly, just so I can use it more. Because um, I recently just got this pen, and I want to be able to use it. It looks like there's ink in there. There's plenty of ink. All right, let me see if I can get it going again. I think it's because I let it sit out a little bit too long. <clears throat> How's it going, Matthew? Do you think beginner artists shouldn't touch digital until they're good on paper? No, I think you should use digital while you're drawing traditionally. It should be used in conjunction. Come on, get the flow. Let's make paper towel. It 
kind of dried out a little bit at the end, so that's why. Okay, there we go. Broco's this is a question from New Yuan. Gesture drawings look like every one of his lines was meant to be, and the next line goes perfectly with the previous lines. Does he have a formula for that? Not necessarily, but let me give you an answer of how that question was given to me from Tarada, Katsuya Tarada. And I asked him the question of like, you know, as you're placing down a line, how do you know where the next line is going to go, right? It seems like it's very natural, like you already know where everything is. Um, well, his answer was very, it, it made sense to me because as he verbalized it, the, it was kind of the way I felt. And how he said it was when he, put, when he puts down a line, the line represents a letter or a word, you know, it could be a word. And each line then naturally goes together because using words, you can form sentences. And those sentences can form essays or poems. And that poem is the image of what you're creating with the construct of all those lines. So each line just makes sense because those are the words you would use to express something. Now, that takes feeling, that takes experience to understand where you need the lines, how much you need the lines. It's kind of choices of lines because line has variation, thick and thin, right? So when I heard that from Tarada, I was like, wow, that makes a lot of sense, actually. I'm going to put another character over here. Um, and I had this really fun little character I drew in this book, which was like a little fun piratey character. So I'm going to put him in here also. Do I use Procreate? I do, absolutely. It's a great program. I love the iPad. I've used it professionally. I use it personally. Uh, when you say you do animation, is it hand-drawn or CGI? When I say I've worked on animation, I mean I've done the, the visual development for it, the designs for the animated stuff. I worked on an animated film, what is it? Actually, no, not last year, two years ago now. Um, it was all early previs, Blue Sky stuff, character design work, um, just early development previs. But it's all, you know, it was all hand-drawn. A lot of it was on paper. Then I moved to digital. Uh, do I have any courses that I could learn from, from Dogload? I do. If you go to my, uh, if you just type in Peter Hahn Style Art Station, that's my website, you'll find a link on Shopify, which I'm teaching courses, which begin February 5th. If you want to pers uh, digitize your own personal sketches, let's say this one, how would you tra transition textures to colors? Um, are those two separate questions? 
because if I want to digitize my personal sketches, let's say this one, I would just scan it high res and then I can just work on it in Photoshop. I can either draw on top of that or paint it directly. Uh, how would you transition textures to colors? So if you're asking about the textures of the drawing or the textures of the paper, because in that sense, obviously I would just use Photoshop to just paint on top of the drawing. Have I used those big ass Wacom tablets? I have, and I have one in front of me, which is the uh, 24 HD. Do you still recommend drawing on chalkboard? I'm going to get one of those and feel that the temporary aspect that helps you a lot to be looser. I have a chalkboard right now behind me on my wall. Uh, I use it mainly for my classes, but you know, personally, do I use it a lot? Not necessarily. But is it a great tool to learn from, especially the idea of impermanence, of letting go of drawings? You can do that here also. You know, It's like this drawing right now that I'm doing, it's not going to last forever, nor is it going to be the best thing, and it may potentially be destroyed. I could have dropped ink all over this thing. You know, I could even just rip it up. But am I going to feel bad about that? Not necessarily, because um, it's in my head. I've already done it. I could draw this for you guys again just like that. So... I'm able to let that go because I don't hold this close to my chest. I'm not saying, oh, this is the best thing in the world. It, it doesn't matter if it is or not, you know. Um, it's just a drawing because I'm just having fun with it to show, you know, to share with you guys. Um, it's not design, and I'm not creating it for something of an illustration or a final piece. It's just drawing for the sake of drawing, just to have fun. Uh, and if you can't just have fun drawing, well, working in the industry will become very jading for you. So this drawing has no intention and purpose of being used for something. So you got to be able to find those moments in time during the day where you can just sit and just draw because you want to. Not because you feel like you have to or somebody's asking you to for a class or a requirement or because you're sitting there trying to like, you know, prerequisite finish a lesson to understand more things and fundamentals without having any of that in place just to just draw, you know. So Shemi asks, have you ever done a drawing you couldn't believe it was you who did it? Not necessarily. Because as artists, we all can understand that we always have certain things about our pieces that we want to correct, do better, make it faster, you know, make it more. So no, I never had that experience. Uh, I am currently a beginner trying to draw figures. When I do the same stroke with two pencils, 2H and 6B, I don't feel a difference in the darkness. Is it because of the technique or the quality of the pencil? It might be your pressure. But it might be your paper also. Uh, try using things like uh, newsprints or things like something with a bit more tooth of paper. Don't use anything too smooth. When you start literally from zero, uh, you do not know how to draw at all, but you really want to learn. How do you start? What mindset should I have? With it just being able to begin without having any expectation that what you're about to create has to be something. So the idea of perfection or expectations of something, right? When you just want to draw because you just want to say something visually. And that could be something you saw, something you have in your head, something of a story, something of your imagination, maybe something fun, right? The idea of looking in the clouds and what do you see? And maybe you can actually draw it out very simply. When people say to me, I can't draw, I can only do a stick figure. Well, you've drawn a human representation using lines and shapes. Once you understand proportion, shape, language, that more and more through lessons, you draw the human more representational, closer to what you see. But to be able to interpret and visualize and put on something on the paper, anybody can do that. Same thing for you, you know, uh, Jack Lake, which is the idea of, you know, how do I get back into drawing after 20 years of break? Being able to sit down and just start, just do it, without having any of this concept of like, it's got to be something really, really good, you know? Because that already limits you in your performance. So you see how I did that right there? <laughs> um, let me even just like describe to you like in that very moment of what I've just done. <clears throat> in this situation, 
when I was about to draw this character with the hand with the sword coming out this way, obviously I have stuff right there. I can't just draw a sword because then it's overlapping all the stuff. So then people will be like, shoot, that's not what I wanted. I want the sword right there. So, I mean, I gotta start it over, right? But I didn't in this situation. How do I actually problem solve this? Well, I thought to myself, he's not a very good pirate. He's not a very good adventurer. Maybe he actually carries around a broken sword, right? So I said, well, I only have limited space. Like, shoot, I can't draw a whole sword. Well, I'll draw a broken one because he's not a very good, you know, <laughs> uh, I guess, fighter or adventurer. He has the worst stuff, right? There's that one character from a movie I saw a long time ago. I don't even honestly remember what it is, but I remember what he had. And he had a, a sword, but when he took it out, there was nothing in it. It was just the, uh, the hilt and the handle. I forgot what that was from. A certain character, I think from a movie. This uh, very ethereal character is riding on mist and clouds and smoke. And this is how I can close in the image. Whereas I get to the bottom of the page, I can use effects. To make it feel like a complete drawing. I don't like going off the page, so I'll use things like this to help me contain it in, in the page. I think there's something on Nib. It's... Okay, now that I've established everything I need to, uh, he's gonna have a glow right there. I'm gonna start to kind of push some darks and uh, separate some elements. No, it's this particular pen. The other one works just fine. Uh, I think I just let it sit out and dry a little bit too much. And because it's such a flex into it, I have to kind of push some water through it later on. I gotta flush it out. It's also brand new, so I just haven't used it enough. So you can see the flow working a lot smoother on this particular pen. But because this is extreme flex, uh, the amount of ink flow, it's not as smooth, but that's the payoff of flex pens like this. Also, when I tend to kind of move really fast, uh, pens can't really keep up. <laughs> uh, usually when I move quickly, I use things like fine liners. Fountain pens, that's why they skip a little bit because I just tend to move a little bit quicker. So if I move slower, then the line will be a lot more consistent. All right, let's start to pump some darks into this, and I'm gonna zoom in a couple of areas. Let's start with the main, with the character on top. Some of the areas of the inner cavities, I'm gonna push dark a little bit. Good question from Sarah. Am I arrogant for believing I can be better than my peers at art or is that just being competitive? I don't think there's anything wrong with thinking that way, but what you don't want to have is this animosity or even the want to squish others, to step on others so that they can't be successful either. It's fine to feel that you can be good, if not better than some other people, but I think you should also be in the position to help, to elevate as well too if you're in the position to do so, right? I 
there is a dog uh, in the back. She is resting on the ground. Uh, you can hear the little chain dingling every now and again. Uh, it's a golden retriever. Her name is Cola, and she's very old, 15 years old as a golden retriever. She can barely see. Uh, she's deaf, and she has bad hips. But she's living the last of her uh, lives with me. Appreciate that. Thank you, Matthew. Well, the vet already told me that they she's got about five months left uh, based on their judgment. I think she'll live a little bit longer, um, but she's left, lived a good life. Um, she's not, she wasn't my personal dog. She was my uh, girlfriend's dog that was in Asia, and we brought her over on the plane as a 14-year-old dog, and she made it really well, but... Um, and the reason why she's over here is because her caretaker had a stroke in Asia and couldn't take care of the dog. So they asked if I would take care of the dog because I had space. And I said I would. So she's staying with me until her last uh, remaining years or last remaining time. This, this 2020 will probably be her last year, most likely. We'll be doing more streams in the future. The streams will always be free on Twitch. I don't know if I'll be streaming on multiple different platforms at once, depending on how the, um, the rules are established by Twitch. I'm not sure exactly. There are a lot of things I'm very ignorant about when it comes to live streaming here on Twitch. Uh, and right now, some people are watching me on YouTube. Some people are watching me on Facebook. Um, so we'll see how it goes. For the future, yes, uh, subscribers will have access to all my previous streams, which are going to be archived and placed up there. Um, and all the live sessions like this will always be on Mondays and Thursdays. The Monday version will be in the evening Pacific time. I'm going to change the Thursday to be maybe in the daytime so that people international can also watch that too. Um, but, you know, this is just to support, you know, the things I'm doing because this is a part of my job, really. My girlfriend, yes, is an artist as well. Um, she works in animation, but I just I want to keep her name protected, so I'm not gonna share anything else as to who she is. I keep a lot of personal stuff under wraps. Uh, I don't put it out there on social media. Um, people say like you know, online social media stuff is invasion of private life, but to be honest, you control what you put out there. You know, so. I don't mind, you know, putting up my own life out there, but I don't put other people's lives out there. Do you remember the last time you drew with the pencil? I did. And actually, let me just show you the pencil that I've used. Uh, it's a tool I would recommend. Uh, you can find them in certain art stores. Um, Noodle, in terms of having a patron or Discord, I'm hoping at some point soon. I just I just been kind of dealing with so much. I just do the live streams, but like I said, Discord will be great for a lot of you guys to like do your challenges and whatnot. But we'll see in the future. Um, this is a pencil I've been using recently. Uh, this is the General Pencil Company, Kimberly. This is a nine XXB. Um, pretty serious, actually. This is a graphite pencil, and I use this one to create. Let me zoom out a little bit. This drawing. So this drawing was done with this pencil. And so 9B, very, very dark. So I liked it because I wanted to be able to get those really heavy contrasts and grain and texture and whatnot. But this entire drawing was done with this one pencil. And this is from a study of Ken Miles, the race car driver, and based on the movie that came out recently, uh, Ford versus Ferrari. Certain films give me inspiration, wanting to like, you know, go into it and studies and whatnot respect for doing pieces that kind of like um i don't know bring awareness to it we've gone about two hours we're going to be going about a half an hour more no matter how far i get to this piece i usually cut the streams off at two and a half hours so if i don't get it done 
I'll finish it later on and I'll post it. Yes, I did spray fixative, Matt. How does it feel to have the ability to draw whatever you want? Well, to be honest with you, even when I was in school at Art Center, I was able to draw whatever I wanted because I would look at the things and draw them. And it was very much based on the class that I was taking. Now, there are some things that were more difficult to draw. Even though I can draw many things, that doesn't mean every single one of them are easy, you know? Uh, for me, when I was younger, landscapes and exteriors were very tough to draw. So it took me a lot more time to develop those shots. Um, over time, it got easier, even within subject matters. I found human form to be very tough. Like we would do a lot of anatomy study and gesture studies and proportions and doing graphite and charcoal study. Figure drawing in general when I was a student was hard. But I can draw the figure. But like I said, as a student, there were some things that were much more strenuous and more time consuming or more mentally draining because I had to focus so much. And even now, you know, I would say there are certain things that would definitely push me. Even though I can draw them, there's something that require much more focus than others. So how did you learn environments? By going outside and drawing real environments, you know? Every time I go like on traveling or hikes or just going outdoors, even especially when I was in school doing classes, we would do landscape paintings landscape drawings, understanding perspective as a part of that, knowing how to compose, uh, how to play with scale, where to place details from the front, you know, leading towards the back, uh, getting a sense of depth, you know, using all those elements. In drawing, you're limited to a line, which makes it much tougher in my opinion. So a line ink drawing to do landscapes is very hard because you gotta make proper choices as to what you wanna place in. With painting, you know, some things, you have a lot, a lot more options based on the fact that you have value, color, uh, simplistic strokes and planes and shapes and some things can be done with a single stroke where with the line work like if you want to push dark value to light value you got to fill it with hatching like this and so it's really tough to balance out um, those values because of it with drawing drawing is also much more time-consuming If figure drawing was hard, what came easier for you back then? Uh, things like animals. I loved creatures. Uh, I liked mechanical things like vehicle shapes. Um, the things that weren't necessarily the actual figure itself. Even though I drew characters a lot, uh, a lot of them were based on more stylized kind of figurative work. But when you're asking like real like representational figure drawing or portraiture, I was never really that great at it. I, I struggled through those. They were tough. Has anyone asked yet about the paper in the sketchbook in front of you? What kind is it? Uh, this is from a company called Bosner. B-O-E-S-N-E-R. It's a company based in Austria. And they make sketchbooks and pencils and tools and all that sort. It's a big brand in, in uh, Europe. Not really available in the U.S., unfortunately. Any tips of learning perspective? Learn the rules of perspective, right? The basics of the rules. Do you understand You know the idea of a picture plane, uh, being able to establish your horizon line, understanding the different points of perspective of, of um, vanishing points, one point, two point, three point, four point, um, you know, understanding how to actually draw base shapes within a plane to make it feel three-dimensional optically. Using eraser is, is perfectly fine. Have I ever drawn from Google Maps? I have actually, that's a great way to draw landscapes. Use Google Maps, bring yourself down to the perspective of the area, move it around, find the perspective of a shot and draw from that. That's a great tool. Only problem is it's all stuck within one perspective of the camera. You can't raise it up or go lower. It's all one view, you know. The time right now in the US is 10, 10 p.m. Pacific time. Then, uh, in terms of are you drawing based on stories that you make before you draw? Well, not really. This character I drew before in a previous sketch. So that previous sketch was... Where'd it go?
this one here. It was a character like a pirate, and he found like a treasure chest, and he's got like his crazy, you know, uh, ghost-like characters around it. So, did I intend to use this character as I drew this one? I didn't. I started drawing this character first, and because I had that already character established, I decided to bring him in. So it was all kind of done on the fly. Aside, in terms of, you know, with your pieces with color, such as like watercolor and whatnot, uh, with the tech series, do you hold back on drawing details knowing you'll paint it later? Absolutely. Not just even tech details, but the amount of hatching I'll do. Right now, the amount of hatching I've done, it creates less opportunity to place in a lot of watercolor for me. So if I wanted to place in watercolor for this one, I wouldn't have actually darkened it like this. I would have kept this just lined like that. <clears throat> Hyena Vaughn asks, if a beginner put the maximum amount of, F amount of discipline and study into the dynamic Bible, can they get good enough to draw wherever they want? Sure. I mean, there's no guarantee that you'll feel 100% confident within a certain amount of time. But if it was an unlimited amount of time and you were very disciplined, uh, how long it took me when I first took the class at Art Center to feel even comfortable drawing many things? About a year, solid. Drawing every single day, one year. And this is back in Art Center when I was uh, 23 years old because I went, took the class at 22 and I took the class twice and I TA'd for it once. So I was with my instructor for a year solid, drawing in that technique at Art Center. Only at the end of that year, I felt somewhat comfortable. Can you tell when you know that you are good enough at gesture drawing? Yes and no. It, it, you know, this is the idea that when you place down lines or shape or indication of details, and it just like feels right to you, you know? It's like that with gesture drawing also. You don't get it all the time. And it's really hard to keep it consistent. Here's a way to look at it. If I did a small thumbnail of this drawing, and then I redrew it again larger, but I really like that thumbnail, and the big final drawing came out weird. I didn't like it as much. What was happening? Well, my initial drawing, the thumbnail, probably had a lot of good energy, but it's really hard to replicate that again exactly. It's almost, imp if, if not impossible, right? So what has to happen is that if you do studies or thumbnails and you have a good energy behind it, understand that you're not going to be able to capture exactly what you had, but you have to try to replicate it through the understanding that this is an independent piece. So you have to tr approach it um, as if you were creating it for the first time. So the thumbnail is a guide. It's not something you have to copy. Does the dynamic Bible go over some aspects of perspective? No, because perspective should be something you should know to some degree before really getting heavier into dynamic, uh, the dynamic sketching approach. Uh, let's see. Sorry, I'm going to keep moving forward a little bit with some of the questions. Here's an interesting one from Pal Cortez. Uh, how do I balance both 3D and 2D mediums? I've been using Blender a lot and wondering if I should be worried if my drawing fundamentals might fade. I try to combine both. Yeah, just go back from one to the other. Sorry, that's my dog coughing up. Uh, do both, okay? So while you're drawing, do other stuff in 3D as well. You know, find ways to balance your time that you're also hitting many things. Um, like I said, you shouldn't compartmentalize and focus all your time on just one thing for that entire month or two. Um, do one thing and then migrate to another and, and see if you can actually bridge them together. You know, as you draw things two-dimensionally, bring them into a three-dimensional piece. Um, CVS asks, when will the Dynamic Bible be in stock? It was in stock. I already sold through 30 of them. I might only have about 30 more left to put up on the store, which I may do so soon. I'm waiting right now because I have to ship out all those books. I'm getting, I'm waiting for confirmation from my printer to see if they're shipped. So once they've done so, I'll restock them. Uh, you hate cross-hatching, but sloshing with ink just feels sloppy. Is there a sweet spot? I think so. Uh, there are certain artists that I feel have this great balance of hatching, but also moving with the ink. Uh, that one particular artist I would say is Heinrich Clay. Okay, so look him up. In terms of his name, you would spell it like this, Clay. Heinrich. Heinrich Clay. Clay, Clay, whatever you want to say. All right, Google him. Night, pal. The fountain pen I'm using right now is a pilot fountain pen. 
and the model is the 912. You know what I'm noticing right now too is that the fountain pen is skipping a little bit because I think it's the paper. On that smooth paper it was really really good but then on this one it doesn't seem to be gripping on it as well for some weird reason. I have to keep testing it. Uh, this is the first time using this pen on this particular sketchbook so I'm noticing a bit of issues here and there in terms of the ability to catch the ink without skipping but on the other paper it was just fine. Yeah, stuff like that's happening. Let me zoom in a little bit closer. So you can really start to see some of the way the work is being done. So you see the line is skipping a little bit, so it's throwing me off in terms of the hatching. So I'm going to switch it back over to the other fountain pen. <clears throat> do I use an eraser? Sure, if I do pencil drawings. Uh, any brown tone sketchbooks I would recommend? Uh, yes, from the Cottonwood Arts brand. Cottonwood Arts sketchbooks. They sell a brown tone sketchbook that I have my students use at Art Center, and it's the one that we go to. Besides that, um, Kenson also makes one as well. It's a scrapbook. The paper is a bit rougher. I would not recommend craft papers. Don't use craft paper. Craft paper and fountain pens or felted pens are a bad combination. Craft paper and pencil is fine. Yeah, and in terms of the crabs being very organic and being able to having difficulty breaking them down, that is a challenge. That is why it's up to you to be able to actually a, attempt to figure out many different ways to um, understand the primitive shapes behind it. Now, I can show you a version of it, but the problem with that is that you'll try to do what I did, but it may not be exactly what you see. That's the issue. So that's why it requires you to actually do multiple studies. But in you, when you do multiple studies, also try to use different shapes. Okay, with the mindset of trying to actually understand how primitive you can make that crab. Again, do you see a square? Do you see a diamond? Do you see triangles? Start with the top view to get the good proportions. From the top view, then try three quarter shot. I would also recommend extracting individual parts and pieces like a claw, a leg, and seeing how you would interpret those sections as well. Let me zoom out a little bit. The ink that I am using right now is the Sailor brand ink. I'm testing out a new ink to see how all it works. The platinum carbon ink is great, but the problem is because it's pigment based, sometimes I have multiple fountain pens and I let them sit, which is not a good thing to do with that kind of ink. I mean, it's not gonna destroy it like other pigment inks, but still, you don't wanna do that. So I'm looking for more water-based inks that still have a little bit of water resistance to them. So I'm noticing that Sailor Ink does actually pretty good. <clears throat> Do you have any tips for watercolor brush and ink? Um, if you're asking about actual just watercolor, uh, the kind of brushes I, I tend to use are just water brushes in general, made by Pentel. They're the brush pens that have uh, basically empty housing that you can just put water inside of. I use that for a lot of my watercolor paintings. Um, any other kind of watercolor brushes you can find are going to be obviously good too. I use the... Um, I don't have my watercolors here with me, but... Um, I use a specific brand. You can use Winsor Newtons. Those are great, you know, lower cost. Uh, paints um, but to be honest with you when it comes to stuff like that when it comes to watercolor my suggestion first is maintain a stronger drawing and then from there light washes okay B build the layers of watercolor Venom asks what do you think of the banana duct tape art that sold for a lot of money and blows my and so to be quite honest with you 
I saw this all over social media, Facebook and whatnot, but I was confused. I had no idea what it was about because I actually didn't research into it. I didn't read about what it was and it really didn't pique my interest to want to know. Um, and even if I'm ignorant about it and not really quite sure exactly, and that's why I don't want to give my opinion because I just haven't looked into it. I just saw a banana and think, okay, cool. It must be some kind of art thing, which it was, art installation. Uh, and people are, I guess, up in arms about it because it's, I guess you're saying it's sold for a lot of money. Um, but for me, whether it did or not, I don't care. <laughs> uh, if people are making a lot of money off of it, great. But I had no actual interest in it, so I didn't look into it. Now, if you're asking if that's art or not, I mean, it's all within the ID beholder. You know, it's like, I'm not going to say one thing is, is, it is or is not something, you know, if someone's willing to pay for it and they see it as art, go for it. It's your money, you know, and someone who created it is being successful from it. I'm not going to deny that people, my person wanted to do that either. For me, it's like in the perspective of like, if someone's successful in doing what they're doing, they solve life that way. Great. You did it, you know, keep going. And there's always going to be people that gripe and complain and the, the so-and-so haters, right? Um, but I don't really pay attention to it too much. Do you offer any online courses? Go to Peter Hahn Style uh, on Google and look for the ArtStation website. You'll find a link to classes I will be teaching in February, my own classes. Appreciate that, Nugmik. How's it going, everyone? Welcome again. Your problem is not the artist, but it's the people buying it. Yeah, well, you know what? When it comes to the art field, the uh, the people with the money or the market dictates trends and popularity of stuff, which, again, <laughs> is now dictated by the people who may have limiting uh, experience and also understanding when it comes to creating art or whatever the case is. Like, for instance, what I consider, you know, what I do, art. I mean, if I'm showing you something of design, I don't really call it art i call it design process i'm problem solving something now does it use art forms right and art materials it does um if you then ask me then what is art i think art can be something of expression something that you're trying to say a statement maybe now again this is just my opinion i'm not saying i'm right um but again like i said if there's no message at all for me myself personally i don't really consider that art you know uh if, if you're saying it has to be just only based on the material and what it just looks like, for me, any monkey can do that, you know? But if there's a meaning, a context of something behind it, of how you can also interpret it in many different ways, that interpretation is something that I think could be led towards the description of an art form, right? But then there's commercial art, then there's figurative art, and there's many ways you can like have subcategories on stuff. But like I said, it's... How people also then are wanting to willing to spend their money on certain things and you know the argument of like is then video games art right and most people will tell you no but i think it is because video games can also have deeper meanings of how you interpret them you know and that's an expression of something using that medium and that game could look simplistic as pixels or it could be highly rendered, like AAA games. So when there are older generations of artists out there who teach and they deny students from like, you shouldn't study anime, you shouldn't study games, it's not art, it's not high concept. To me, that's wrong, you know? It's just a different generation. I think animations whether they come from whatever country they come from can also be art they can be just as deep if it has to be deep but it can also be aesthetically pleasing if it needs to be do i use any visualization techniques um well i'll try to draw from memory a lot sorry shaheen i missed one of your questions but, uh, you know, I'll draw from observation and then I'll try to recreate it from memory. So whatever I looked at and drew it as a basic primitive form, I'll try to replicate it again. That's one of the exercises I'll have even students do. Draw from memory. Uh, one addition to that is when you draw from memory, um, try to actually turn it in your head 
without actually having seen the physical thing. So for instance, if I had the skull and I drew it from this angle of view and you sketched it and I took away that object. Now I said, draw that skull again, but now draw from a different angle. Having seen it now, would you be able to do it? That's a tough exercise, but that's one that I also add to <laughs> students' exercises. And it's very much based on how you studied it from the first part. Devanchi Dave, if you never use pencil again, I think you're missing out on some things. I still love pencil. I'm not saying you should, you know, you can go about the way you want to, but I think pencil is a great tool. I'm just saying each piece that I create has intention and purpose of what tool I want to use based on what it's for. Uh, but I'm not going to say that I, I just, you know, I also just favor ink. Uh, I do. But I think pencil can be great, especially when I want to use it for something. If I do figure drawing, like at workshops and stuff, I always use charcoal. Favorite instructional art books? Um, anything from James Gurney is awesome. Star Lord, you know, says what bugs me the most is when people put one dot on a canvas and call that art. Yeah, I, I would agree. Honestly, I wouldn't find that to be a piece of art. But I mean, like, but that's where you can argue with me and saying that. But didn't you just say, like, whatever you create, as long as there's some kind of contextual meaning or deeper meaning, even that could be an art piece. <laughs> uh, and I'd be like, yeah, I guess that, that is what I said. So then wouldn't a piece, a dot, if that artist was able to express something behind it, couldn't be a, be a piece of high art? Well, that is the argument of fine art, right? And that is why I am not a fine artist. <laughs> And nor would I ever buy a piece of fine art. I, I'm, I'm more technically driven. I love drawing. I love painting. I love studies of forms and shapes and stories. So that's where my money will go. <clears throat> Books and comics and movies and games and illustrations. Fantasy, sci-fi, modern or historical. Anyways, it's at 2.22 right now in terms of how long we've gone. I've focused most of my attention on this particular character at the moment. Uh, I will continue potentially just kind of moving down uh, this image. I'll probably hit a few areas in the back dark side here where the light is coming out a little bit. Um, probably hit a bit more dark areas down here too. But I don't know how much. I mean, I'll go more once we finish with the stream. Other YouTube art creators with same style of art that can inspire us. Stan Mueller, unfortunately, I don't really explore YouTube uh, or Twitch or uh, social media of any type for looking for art instructions. I will look for programs like schools and platforms that artists will use, but I don't necessarily scour through social media to find who would offer that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, the schools I teach at, usually those instructors will maybe go on their own and develop their own stuff. So I could recommend some of those people. So what I would recommend first is look at the schools. So look at places like the Concept Design Academy, Brainstorm School, uh, Schoolism, uh, SVS Learn, New Masters Academy. These are places that you can go to define the different uh, artists that work there. Um, and then look to see if they've actually developed anything on their own. So Evan Amundsen is one of those people too. He teaches with Schoolism, I believe, still, or with other places. But he's a great instructor and also a phenomenal artist for character work and fantastical uh, stuff and historical things. He's very knowledgeable. And I respect his work a lot. And he does Twitch streams, I believe. I gotta follow him, that reminds me. Have you met Jim Lee? I have not. I would like to. Uh, and Sarah, if you're still here, I actually did watch one of his streams and uh, I liked it. I thought it was pretty cool. It was interesting to see him sketch, you know, he's, he's one of those kind of old school guys with a pencil and eraser and he just draws something, erases it, draws something, erases it, <laughs> you know, uh, and that's, that's Jim. I really enjoy Jim Lee's old work still. His current new work today, I mean, again, I respect him as an as a artist and a businessman like crazy, but I don't really buy his work these days anymore, um, but I still do will very much buy his old stuff. Back when he was working on Uncanny X-Men, uh, Punisher, Warzone. Man, that old stuff that he did was raw. 
It's too clean now. <laughs> That's what it is. So, Lucy, if, if you have access to Scandinavia, there is also the Animation Workshop in Denmark, which has classes. And I've done stuff there. I've actually done two workshops there uh, a couple years ago. And I, I loved an Animation Workshop. Denmark is beautiful. That school is amazing. And I would highly recommend it. Yeah, uh, Robocars. I mean, again, I love Jim's old work because of the fact that there is this sense of energy in the characters and the line work that he just doesn't maintain anymore because he cleans it up way too much, I think. But I think it also has to do with the, the person that he worked with as an inker, you know? The people that inked his, his line work was different back then. Sarah, yeah, that you know, I know you mentioned Akira as a TV series, but uh, do you think Akira is a franchise that should be left alone at this point? Absolutely. <laughs> I think it should, it should be left at the masterpiece as it is, as the manga, and also the animated film. <clears throat> For other Twitch stream artists, look at uh, Evan Amundsen, and also look at Bjorn Hiri. Um, I don't know anybody else who actually does Twitch streams that are my friends personally. Yeah, Barsket is B A R uh, S K uh, C E Y, I believe. A good way to use value is about being able to separate objects and forms like this hand. If I darken that value on the top and then darken all the stuff underneath it, you will lose the hand silhouette. So I want to make sure I darken the stuff underneath the hand more to push the values down to make sure the silhouette of the hand pops out further. So I'm uh, framing things, using values to help separate things. Thank you, Chantal, for sharing. Appreciate that. Thanks, Sarah. And Kevin, thanks a lot. I'm also going to use a darker value to wrap around this character. I'm not going to push him as dark because I want all this dark behind him to push him forward. And I'm choosing to do so because that's what I want you to see. It's not about is it realistic? Well, obviously these characters are stylized, so I'm not really interested in how realistic it looks. I'm interested in like, is it an interesting story, interesting characters, a setting? And I want to make sure I know what I want you guys to look at. So many schools in SoCal. Do you know of a good school atelier in the Bay Area? But I don't want to have to sell a liver to afford to do so. First thing is I wouldn't recommend the Academy of Art. Don't go there. Um, I have had a couple of students that have gone to CCA with relative successful results. Um, beyond that, there really isn't a lot going on up there in the Bay Area, especially when it comes to schools in LA like the uh, Concept Design Academy or Brainstorm. Not, something like that doesn't really exist up there. Um, yeah, there, there actually used to be a gallery that was started by a bunch of ILM people, but that also got shut down too. So unfortunately, you're a little bit limited in the Bay Area. Appreciate that, Kareen. We can have bounce lights. Lights coming from different directions if I want to. But I can just darken this entire area up, make it more lit in the front. I don't want that light to be intense either. It's supposed to be a low light. So I'm gonna put a little bit of a backlight here, or a dark up here, dark here, and keep a lot of this kind of as it is. When practicing proportions for accuracy, what should I think about? Should I just keep checking this mass? Is two times height of that mass until I have those relative measurements? Internalize, yes. What you can also do is look for landmarks. Those landmarks are things you can always find on many, many figures, obviously. Um, and you can use those as a way to always measure stuff. Landmarks of bone protrusion, right? So in the head, we have things like cheekbone, the chin, to the brow, nasal, to the ears. Like in the body torso, we have things like the clavicle. Uh, sternum, end of the rib cage, that kind of stuff. I 
I think another Penn uh, draftsman who I thought was so good with value and light and, uh, because, like I said, I'm still learning, uh, would be Bernie Wrightson. Bernie Wrightson is incredible as a draftsman for light and value. Uh, Bernie Wrightson. Do you study art from other pro artists' work? Not so much these days. I did before for sure, but I would definitely analyze them because I can now internally uh, break them down in my head and visualize and start, you know, kind of understanding what the artists are doing. So do I still study to a degree, but I don't necessarily study by drawing their piece. I study by looking at it and internalizing. I've seen a writing piece in person. It was a really the famous series of the Frankenstein. It was at a show where um, Guillermo del Toro had a gallery show, and he owns those Bernie Wrights and pieces. They're incredible. Absolutely incredible. That guy had such a compelling control of light and value. What's crazy about Bernie Wrightson is he's self-taught. He learned perspective on his own. So for those of you like, you know, can I do this being self-taught? Yeah, you can. There are people out there that have made it very well. Mobius is one of my favorites. Actually, let me show you this book I just picked up. Uh, this is a Mobius book called 40 Days. I would highly recommend it. It's made, produced by Mobius, their own production. And it's a series of drawings he, he just drew for 40 days. And they're masterful. And they're just random, you know, just stuff. <laughs> uh, a lot of it just, it's his imagination. It's his world. You know, he was so bizarre in how he thought. But this guy was a master. Like, because what he's doing here is how he would move with the form, with the cross contour, how he would hatch, how he hatches to move the three dimensions of the shapes. Amazing book. 40 days. Oh yeah, the Incal is awesome. Um, I mean, honestly, all of Mobius' stuff is crazy good. I have another book uh, that it's kind of like impossible to find now because they don't really have it in print anymore. Where did I put it? Um, shoot. I wish I had it on hand. It's the Heinrich Clay book. And the Heinrich Clay book that I have is from the 1940s. And it's a collection of his drawings, like a sketchbook. And I've seen Heinrich Clay's original sketchbook too. Uh, that, that guy, oh my god. His sketches are absolutely insane. But I have a printed version of one that's very much like it. Uh, and I wish I just had it on me right now. I could show it to you, but next time. <clears throat> Yeah, Mobius worked on many films, many, many films. What is your opinion on rotating the paper to get weird angles? And will there be a spring summer class for online courses? I will be teaching spring, summer, and fall of my own classes uh, that I teach through online. I'll be having physical classes like Art Center, um, CDA, going into this spring and the fall, not the summer. But in terms of rotating, yeah, rotate as much as you want to. I'm not rotating because I'm... I know that I'm streaming to you guys, and if I kept rotating the paper, it would be disorienting to you. So even when I draw digitally, I don't rotate the canvas. But I do this consciously, because I know I don't want to disorient you guys. Now, the 40 Days book was actually produced by Mobius Production. Two thirty-four. Okay, we are now coming down to our last five minutes. Um, if anybody has any last couple of questions, please do let me know. I appreciate you guys all hanging out, asking questions, great questions, challenging questions too, and helping each other out. I apologize if there are certain ones that I missed or I didn't explain to the best of my ability. Uh, again, like I said, I'm always trying to figure out ways to best communicate and talk about things and share you my own opinions. And these are my own personal thoughts and opinions on things. Please don't take them as direct answers or things you have to do. Uh, and I'm sure you guys all realize that, and I'm sure it's very obvious. But at the same time, as always a reminder, you're here just to you know engage with me. I'm just drawing, just for fun. So hopefully you guys got something out of it. Uh, and if you didn't, hopefully next time you will. 
and I hope you will find other artists that will give you the information that you need to have to move forward in your career or your focus of education. Um, and then if you guys have more questions in the future, continue asking. Uh, I'll be doing another stream next Monday. And on the Monday piece, it'll be in the evening Pacific time, 7 or 8 p.m. Um, but always Mondays and Thursdays, I'm planning to do a stream. Next Thursday, I may be off because I'm flying out to Texas. I'll be uh, in Texas doing going to a uh, bird hunting meet. <laughs> so I'm going with a friend to go check out uh, a bunch of people that do falcon and bird hunting, eagle hunting, and they get together. So they invited me to come out and check it out. So. Sorry, I just missed a quick question about one of the fountain pens. Which fountain pen do you use? Or are there fountain pens for drawing? No, all fountain pens are for either writing or drawing. The falcon pens made by Pilot are actually specifically more for drawing. Look at those. Those are pretty good. Uh, do you have any suggestions on drawing cylinders? Draw boxes first. Boxes first. Find out the minor towards the major axes to be able to draw the ellipse inside and to be able to get the cylinder inside that shape. Okay. Is there going to be a Dynamic Bible 2? There is an extension, Volume 2, coming up this year. I'm working on it right now. I have to get it done in February, at the end of February. <laughs> It'll be published by Super Ronnie, and that will be out in July, which is essentially taking the subject matter that I've already covered in the Dynamic Bible, but going much deeper into the process. Um, I'm flying into Austin, I believe, but it's not in one of those bigger cities. It's in a smaller one outside of it. I can't remember the top of my head, unfortunately. Sorry. What's the longest break you have ever taken from art in general? A couple days, weeks, months, usually days. From my entire life, days. That's it. <laughs> There's never been a period where months have gone by where I haven't drawn. That's never happened. Let alone years. Couple days. Uh, Shanghai. In terms of the book, the book can be shipped anywhere because I ship it from my printer in Korea. Uh, this latest orders is still going out, so the printer has to get back to me. I sent in all the orders already, so hopefully they will ship them real soon. And once they do so, I'll place up more in stock soon. Sorry for the click clacking with my dog walking across the hardwood floor. People ask like all these like random noises sometimes. And it's my old dog. This is an F. Yes, this is a fine. <clears throat> How long do I spend drawing in a day, roughly? This is the first drawing I have done today, and it's 10 p.m. right now. I started at eight, so I've drawn two hours today. <laughs> some days I'll draw more, some days I'll draw less. But what I will tell you is I draw every single day. All right, so as we come to this point, I will continue working on this and I'll post it soon. But this kind of shows you we began initially with the construction of the skull. Uh, we were looking at the little model sculpture with it. I did you know side views with a couple different angles and shots. Uh, did these studies here first too, talking about organic and geo shapes. And then we kind of did a, a study of a character piece here within a, I don't know, some setting of a pirate. Um, and I'll continue working on it. We'll see where it goes from here and I'll post it later on. But Anyways, and we have the last question from Fritz. <clears throat> last year I studied basic drawing, and I also do some practice figure drawing frequently, and now I'm practicing using a pen, not a pencil anymore. Am I too fast because I think I can do it? Well, you can always push the envelope, but you might have to be very aware of what's happening at the current stage of your work. Compare and contrast to other people. If you notice it's not being up to the same level, if not more so, you gotta backtrack and make sure you hit those fundamentals again more. Uh, but like I said, use all of them in conjunction, you know, it's like continue going back and forth and it's like spinning plates as you have all these things you're working with. And eventually as you have less focus on one thing, that plate will start to wobble, it'll fall. So you got to spin it back up again, right? So you got to constantly tend to it. Here, you know, I've said this before in the previous streams, but here's what I say about fundamentals. The idea be behind fundamentals is that it's a constantly eroding platform. If I draw perspective, figure drawing, you know, shape language, whatever the case is, those fundamentals all work together, but that fundamental constantly erodes by falling apart because your memory phase, you don't use it as much, whatever the case is. So you always have to pack it. You always have to make it stronger. So you're always going back to fundamentals constantly, all right?
What would you call this character? Well, he's a pirate, and he's supposed to be essentially a guide to something, maybe a treasure, maybe to some other character, maybe to a different world. Uh, so that's what I'm saying. Monday, I'll be back on again. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you again for stopping by. And like I said, these streams are being archived and I will be putting them on Twitch. At the moment, they're only for subscribers. We'll see how it goes in the future. If people are very adamant about not wanting that, then we'll see what happens. But like I said, for now, I'm treating it like a Patreon where Twitch, people that can subscribe can watch all the previous ones eventually soon. I'll put them up there. Uh, for the moment, live sessions will always be free. And so come and talk to me anytime you want to. Thanks a lot, you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you.